I just came back from beating street thugs. Walking out of Starbucks for gentrifying the prices of my food. <sighs> Nothing like the taste of summer berry panna, coda frappuccino, ice macchiato, 2% milk, 1% oat milk, 3% sugar, 1% Pomeranian, gross beans. Let me get one thing straight. While Miles Morales is a better Spider-Man than Peter Parker, it's not because he can go invisible. It's not because he didn't kill his original love interest. It's not because he has better villains, a more profound outlook on life, or because his story is impeccable. It's because he can say the N word. He has a past. He's Himmel. Himmel and Himmus. Him or Humber him, even. His blackness is the root of his ops, his friends, his school, his neighborhood, etc. Now contextualize what I just said. In the modern age, when comic books are at an all time high in sales and the renaissance of diverse experiences are being pushed out in the media, Spider Man being black is dope as hell. Into the Spider Verse was one of my first experiences with relatability. Sure, Miles looks nothing like me. His hair texture is curlier. He's lighter, he's shorter, he's younger. But his performance of black masculinity reverberates with my experiences in a way that most other superheroes just can't encapture, specifically because they haven't had the experience of being an anomaly. I think a talking flamingo is a bit of an anomaly. Anomalies are present because of a system that deprives black people of opportunities. Similar to Miles, a lot of black men have trouble fitting in with this socially concocted notion of an embodiment of culture we're supposed to perform on a day-to-day -day basis. In the beginning of the first movie in the Into the Spider-Verse series, from a social perspective, Miles is a loser. He can't talk to women, he's awkward, his dad's a cop, and he listens to Post Malone in the morning. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. Although, Sway Lee ate that track, so I'll give it a pass. Eh, 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 eh. Miles Morales is very much still learning how to be himself and black in real time. Into the Spider-Verse, to me, is so much more than just a Spider-Man movie. It's a coming-of-age story about a black boy in Harlem learning how to navigate around all his newfound responsibilities in tandem with his own internalized depictions of culture that he's been socially subjected to. Miles Morales wouldn't be Miles Morales if he wasn't black because his racial identity is integral to the story. Quintessential even. Being a disenfranchised boy living in the Bronx with the only avenue out of his emplaced living conditions being a diversity program in a prestigious school filled with white students who've known wealth their whole entire life makes Miles Morales an anomaly. He's not meant for the avenues and twists his life brings him, but somehow he always makes the best of them. Peter Parker facing adversity, getting pummeled, but standing up again embodies a different theme when the type of adversity is shifted. And I love the original Peter Parker, okay? So much so that I had all the Spider-Man games as a kid. I had Spider-Man attire. Spider-Man has been a heavy part of my adolescence and childhood. But at the time, five-year-old me was looking at Spider-Man and just thinking, well, I guess that's a cool dude. He swings from building to building and he beats up bad guys. It doesn't really take much to please a kid. My renaissance with Spider-Man, as I'm sure a lot of y'alls did, came with the integration of these new spiders in into the Spider-Verse. Um, actually... New to the cinematic universe okay I don't know I didn't read the comics okay nerd okay nerd okay nerd okay nerd I just wanted to share my knowledge we don't share knowledge here okay nerd I talk and you listen okay nerd okay nerd okay nerd black boys have a hard time deciphering when and where they should be black how their perceptions of self is fathomed by others, and how we fit into this mold of black masculinity that the whole world thinks we should perform. I said this in a video a time before, but I wanna reiterate that being black has never really had any positive resonations in my white space I've been accustomed to in my daily life, other than exoticized idolations of culture. When in reality, this culture wasn't really even mine to embody. I'm a Sudanese refugee. Nowhere near cultural juggernauts like New York, California, Milwaukee, Baltimore, Philadelphia, to name a few. I'm a Southern Sudanese person living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I had to learn to navigate society as a black person without the presence of a structured black community around me. I had to learn AAVE. I had to actively go out online and practice endorsing in black culture. I had to literally grow into this caricature of swagger that you see now as turf. While actively being scrutinized simultaneously Simultaneously from an outside standpoint of not being black enough in specific circles of friends or being too black in a workplace environment. Hey, but don't get me wrong. It's a demonized way of being alive, but hey, we're here. Being a black man is a constant performance of hyper masculinity that fuels your whole experience. Miles Morales felt it. I felt it. And maybe y'all have felt it in certain ways throughout your life. This video is going to be my thoughts and reflections on why I love being an anomaly 
why the world calls different experiences anomalies, and how we fit into the grand ethos of structure. Because as enthralling as the performance of black masculinity or gender identity is, be it the lingo, the shoes, the hair, the charisma, when it's time to contextualize how to be ourselves, to face racial profiling, limited job opportunities, fetishization, transphobia, homophobia, or disenfranchised experiences. Our marginalized cards of identity don't revoke us from being seen as a caricature of a person. They emphasize it. But how can we figure out how to be anomalies and enjoy ourselves in present time, in real time? Hope amongst the twisted fate is real. But anyways, let's check back on Theo. That's him. Statistic 997865432. This statistic is supposed to have one of the better odds. They live in Canada and have the luxury to express their gender. Barely. A nice little flamingo. We're in hell. Hey, you're not allowed to say that. He's been excommunicated. Canadian on Canadian violence. You love to see it. Besides avoiding shaky local video essayists, Turbus had the luxury of being an anomaly. His life, work, and monetary services are provided by a phone which reminds them they want to be anywhere else but here in Universe 666. But hey, it's an apple. He's contributing to a system of exploitation while being exploited and critiquing the exploitation. It's a life lived weirdly. Sure it is. Statistic 997865432198732424. I mean, I can go outside. Ah, outside. With a black population of a whopping 4%. Did you know that 27% of black children here live in poverty? That's wild, like, couldn't be me. Your disembodied voice only being used for my YouTube channel. Pipe down a bit. Whoa, calm down, Jamal. Don't pull out the nine. Am I right, Cracker? Shut up, I'm doing something important today. Yeah, Tib got a gift card from his scene points and he's using it to watch Into the spider food. Considering he's one of a smaller minority with the luxury of time and money to watch this film, that's kinda cool, right? Stop following me. Shh. Turn off your phone, you restarted. Did you clock the anomaly? You mean the aspect of being black? Yeah, it's like a metaphor for Western survivability. Miles Morales is him. Kimmy Henderson. Timberland. This is weird. It's almost like I did this earlier. What happened? Some kind of spider bite from a spider with a big ass number on it. It's like, I can't even, I don't, I don't know numbers that high. Hey, hello, Turb? God, this is just like every other upload. Audience, just know that Turb will ghost you for like literally no reason. I know black time is a thing, but they got to intersectionally consider African time. Because what is this thing on? There's supposed to be a cue for a scene change there, but while I have you, hey, you may not know me, but my name is Abilla, and I'm the newest- Let's do this one more time. Hey, hi, howdy, this is Derb. The pink-haired dude that gets into existential crises about his own existence on an I week-to-week basis. We were on TikTok eight times, got deleted every time we hit 100k, found thick. A lot of other creators made some bangers, anti-parliament, anti-police, anti-hegemony, anti-, -police, anti pink hair and a talking flamingo. And as a YouTuber that sustains themselves off their art, I got bit by the spider a chance. This is my Patreon if you want to support me, consider subscribing. You'd help me so much, you get videos sooner, you get mentioned at the end of videos, link in the description. <laughs> Fathoming black masculinity is a complicated ordeal. First off, there's anti-black norms surrounding racial depictions of character you constantly have to fight so much that microaggressions instead become fourth wall apparition breaks, which once in a while remind you that. I'm well aware that I attract what I allow. You're black. I'm not exaggerating when I say in my social circles, I constantly remember I'm black through the depictions of stereotypes or dog whistles the earth writers up there throw in the dialogue tree. Thank you, God. It's a nice little nudge, you know? When Mo Bamba comes on for the sixth time in an event, I relish that those snow sardines can't sing half of it. But subconsciously, I know being a six foot five black man in a room is intimidating enough for them to take that sentiment seriously. This is important because black masculinity most of the time is enforced by aspects of violence. Maybe the black people there feel uncomfortable 
uncomfortable because of the hundreds and hundreds of years of black oppression culminating into isolating social experiences only we feel and continue to feel on an eye daily basis from y'all maybe you can't fathom being subjected into a caricature of brute masculinity with hyper specific fixations of your race maybe the anger surrounding the n-word isn't situated in the past maybe it's just a continuation of reinforced bigotry felt in the modern day it's almost like historically white people don't understand conjectures outside of their own race however the experiences of a black man is a specifically jarring algamation of white supremacy in tandem with internalized anti-blackness and ideals that fit together differently with everyone that internalizes this experience and how miles traverses through his reality of blackness how he develops a realization of self and how 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 he just can. that's the cherry on top of what i want to discuss today anyone, anyone can, can wear, wear the mask, mask. it's how you wear it that's what wait what, why are you back and, and weren't you angelism i swear to god the narrator of this video um, was angelism. let me have my moment term fine but like what is the mask it's a lived experience you know it when you endorse it in yourself myself it's nothing but a leap of faith act one conceptualizing miles morales into the Spider-Verse is the first movie of all time being marketed globally with the black teen on the front poster. A movie that would kickstart an animated renaissance in global box offices, Puss in Boots, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, etc. Miles Morales has become a staple for this generation. I mean, sure, we always knew there was a black Spider-Man, but it was always an afterthought. Like when Peter Parker gets three series of his own movies and is almost always a little whimsical white boy dedicated to fighting justice. The character in my mind becomes synonymous with, hey, that's a cool superhero, but it's not really me. You know, something in the way. <laughs> Melanin. When my cognitive thinking skills began, and I started to search for more stories beyond the grade 7 Percy Jacksons for an air of familiarity or personal relatability. As a young adult, movies like Black Panther and shows like Atlanta were way more intriguing than whatever next white boys was fighting demigods or terrorizing their family with caricatures and conceded belief in their own moral superiority. Although Roderick was the go, he just wasn't me. And then Into the Spider-Verse happened, and the floodgates of black representation opened up to not only nerdy white boys who saw themselves in this heroic spider but anomalies be as anomalies be spider-man embodying a black caricature came with some haters haters being the embodiment of fate we come to known as miguel o'hara spider-man 20099 2099. A man who rules over the galaxy as Spider-Man called the Spider-Verse, specifically because of personal trauma regarding the idea of canon. You could kind of swap this out with reality or structure. A canon system that has anomalies it can't explain. Remember that adhering to systems that perceivably work sometimes isn't the best idea. You might end up Uncle Arcus. But this faith in canon, in structure, in mitigated reality, led Miguel to become detached to the idea of life outside of canon. Miguel also makes a lot of assumptions about this flaw odd, unstable reality, thinking that if he doesn't police the system effectively, it'll deteriorate and collapse if not policed effectively. Thus, he becomes its judicial leader. Fate is one of mystery. Though. Best believe spider people, l like, like black people, aren't a monolith. And while there are common threads of institutional and systemic oppression working against our favor, Miles seems to overcome the jarring fate of disenfranchisement through glitches in systemic institutions, which allow him to have opportunities no one would have thought he would have had. But did you know that before Into the Spider was even fathom. Miles had to overcome the scrutiny of a lot of Miguel's, of a power even more jarring than inner city New York. <sighs> comic book fans. Miles vs. Little Nerdy Dudes. 2011 was comic book D-Day with Ultimate Spider-Man being killed for the purpose of instilling a new one in this universe. What's interesting about the public reception of Miles was the outrage from a pretty big majority of fans. Not all of it was racist though to be fair. Marvel has killed almost every single one of their characters and brought them back no matter how big or small the name of the hero. Spider-Man multiple times, Captain America, Thor, Hulk, Iron Man, etc. And naturally, when a publisher decides to get rid of a beloved hero in return for a fresh new face, there's gonna be some backlash. Long-term comic book fans are naturally conservative with the content they digest. They want to see new stories, but with the old faces they've been accustomed to. So seeing a black mask take on the mantle of one of the most pivotal, beloved, and celebrated characters in comics was jarring to the audience. It definitely was from a place of nostalgia and parasocialism around the image of what Spider-Man should be. But since Miles Morales was black, he was subjugated to the worst types of racism known to man from a very vocally displeased audience. Stan Lee, God rest his soul, is a light in the tunnel I kind of want to get into. Of course, he's come up with iconic, diverse roles, like the X-Men inspired by the Black Civil Rights Movement. But his writings highlight marginalized struggles in a way that can still appear to the broader white demographic, who at the time were the 
focal selling points of his comics. Sar, Sar. Stanley and Marvel have a very complicated history of back and forth, but understanding this history helps us understand how Miles Morales came to be, how propaganda works. To critique the ethos of the Spider-Verse is also to point out structural adherences faced in the movie. I love the Spider-Verse, but even Stan Lee acknowledged that heroes die. Spider-Man, Iron Man, Thor, Fred Hampton, Felix, Malcolm X, same way villains die. Doctor Doom, Magneto, Galactus, Queen Elizabeth, Henry Kissinger. But what makes a hero and what makes a villain? And what do their deaths even mean? Stories poke at the moral conscious of our world's understanding in order to paint a picture of reality we can visualize experience. The best world building uses Earth as a base of reasoning, and since Earth has lore. Shout out to CJ the X, by the way. The ways in which our understanding of Earth's practices, our reason within our little thingamabobbers here, can be bent with creativity. But let's go further. What happens when our understanding of Earth's practices are flawed on purpose? And what if these flaws actually help normalize media ingrained commonalities in our everyday life? I mean, did you know that if you light a cigarette and flick it into gasoline, nothing happens. Departments have actually run the same test hundreds of times with differing conditions to no avail. Okay, so why are there some people in prison right now sitting in jail cells? Because the myth of the gasoline cigarette is normalized enough that a system that holds jurisdiction can hold them in prisons for a decade. But it's okay, because it can totally happen, right? Would you call Miles a hero, Gwen a hero, Jefferson a hero, and for what reason? What? I'm in the mindset that we're all intricate human beings. You're more than just two traits someone can name you for. So defining good and bad is a basic position in a world where our choices are stifled. Think of voting. Both of these gremlins fund genocide. And now we're gonna have to choose who's funding it next. Morality in a story, to me, is defined by a character's actions and stances against restrictive or harmful people acting in a society. But we have to remember that Villains have feelings too. Turb wants the villain to burn down the world and start it anew. Oh, how beautiful thou be. A villain is usually a character shaped by the realities of oppression around them. When they clash with the hero, it's not just their fist crossing. It's their ideals, their core values, ideations of society hitting each other. So when the hero wins, we feel like a greater good has been accomplished, not just because the villain is gone, but also because of the ideals they carry with them, hopefully ceasing to exist. This is Stan Lee, remember, he's not Marvel. He's just Stan Lee, important, important distinction. To understand his reasonings, we have to understand ours. Funnily enough, with Gen Z, it starts with Paw Patrol. Oh, look at him, he's so cute, Oh, Look at him. This little puppy has invaded households everywhere. A cute cuddly dog serving the people. Kinda harmless, right? I mean, he don't got a gun, he only got a wolf. In 1915, there was a mutual film court case where the Supreme Court dictated that films are not protected First Amendment speech, meaning the government can censor them. In an attempt to prevent this, film companies created the Hayes Code, which is a series of rules dictating what people could or couldn't do. You can't show interracial relationships. Can't show people kissing more than five seconds. You can't show government officials in a bad light. You have to show that the system works. And thus television and film began to portray police as fundamental to any functioning society. Why was that awful? Was I the villain for that? Remember that cops are only 4% of the population, yet being disproportionately represented in media centered or a presence in around 30% of TV shows across the board. The same criteria of media restriction was heavily in place on Stan Lee. He worked with limitations of portrayal systematically placed on comics at the time. Although sometimes I wish Stan Lee was more intersectional, I like to believe he was working with the creative limitations he had. And yes, his artwork has clearly grown to be a critique of the social conditioning of the times, working with John Ramita Sr. to address issues such as the Vietnam War, student activism and racism. However, the comic code states, policemen, judges, government officials, and respected institutions shall never be presented in such a way as to create disrespect for established authority. This one differs from the Hayes Code shown previously. This one was specifically used by, by comic book people peeps. So while Stan Lee went on to pen stories which switched the masks of villains and heroes to form a more concise view of how we should tackle social critique, such as when Spider-Man encountered police about to shoot a young black boy, contextualized in the real world as police doing their job normalcy under false pretenses of objective structural morality, meaning normally the power dynamic of a cop is enforced through the title and a moral understanding that they're serving us. When that's not the case, oh 
FD and Lil Bill did very good videos on these topics specifically. They're here. They will be in the description. Spider-Man understands the feeble moral practices of policing and thus de-escalated the situation, then helped the boy. The hero in the story is the one that can look through societal conditioning and create new ways of existence. And that's Spider-Man. Again, though, these stories had their limits. The way this boy was just roaming around the streets waiting to shoot someone. A little racist. Just like objective understanding has its limits, you know, nothing is solidified. Now, this is a something circle used to summon new energy alex and i have been friends for a long time he's seen me grow from 3k to 80k i've seen them grow from 5k to 200k someone's winning i don't know my comic knowledge is limited but alex has researched read analyzed comics on youtube dissecting characters like mj in the realms of femme presentation Alex, Alex, on the wall. Who is Miles Morales in the comics, fam? I mean, Miles is kind of the opposite of Peter in the comics. It's kind of a Spider-Man tradition at this point that when they first get their powers, they get it all wrong. You know, they, they focus on the wrong thing. Now with Peter, it's greed. It's chasing money and fame and revenge against all the people who've wronged him. These powers are everything he's ever wanted. And as a result, he's way too cocky. He's way too sure of himself. But with Miles, it's the opposite. It's fear. It's self-doubt. He's like, fuck all this. I never asked for any of this. I just want to be a normal kid. And his situation is made way worse by the fact that Peter Parker's just died. New York's fallen in love with this symbol of hope, this story of a 16-year-old kid who died doing the right thing. Peter Parker is a household name. His last acts have united generations and what, Miles is just supposed to be the symbol? Without any training or experience or any natural desire to do any of it? It's a completely impossible standard and one that he's being pressured into. He's being told by one half of the world that if he doesn't be Spider-Man then he's letting down Peter's legacy, you know, he's betraying his memory. While at the same time being told by the other half of the world that he's just a cheap copy, you know, he's not fit to be Spider-Man. Now for the majority of his first run, Miles is just trying to be Peter. When he meets a bad guy, he thinks, what would Peter do? He tries to tell jokes as he's fighting, but none of them land because he's just not that funny. That's not him. And so while he does love the thrill of it all and all the cool stuff that S.H.I.E.L.D.'s given him, the weight of Peter's legacy is just too much and his heart's not in it. When his mother dies, it's like the final straw. It's the final reason why he's not fit to be Spider-Man. And he quits for an entire year. Everyone's trying to talk him back into it. His best mate Ganky grills him for not being Spider-Man. Gwen, having only met Miles a couple of times, smacks the shit out of him because yeah, that's the best way to get work out of people, well done. To be fair, she's not as bad as the original version of her who joined a white supremacist, refused to elaborate, then died. It's a low bar, but still, things could be way worse. The only person who manages to turn him around is Spider-Woman. Now in this universe, Spider-Woman, or Jessica, is a clone of Peter Parker. She has no family, no friends, no sense of self-image, she's got nothing. And this revelation is very important for Miles. While before he was crumbling under the enormity of being a superhero and treating Spider-Man like it's some higher power, something he's not worthy of, he now realises that these superheroes that he's been putting on a pedestal are just broken people. Like him. Jessica gives Miles the same pep talk as all the others, but the key difference is she's not forcing him to do anything. She just gives him the tools he needs to make his own decision. She says, here's a list of reasons why there needs to be a Spider-Man, here's why I'm doing what I'm doing, but the final choice needs to be all you. This is the first moment in over a year where someone's actually, like, acknowledged his autonomy. Now that he's been given a choice, now that he's got express permission to do whatever the hell he wants and just sit back and be a normal kid, he realises that that's not actually what he wants. The absence of all these outside voices telling him what to do has given him the space to realise his own self-worth, his own capabilities. With Jessica's story having grounded his expectations, Miles allows himself room to fail, and in doing so he exceeds the standard he once thought he was capable of. By the end of his first run, he not only understands the symbol, he's able to take ownership of it, and it's very satisfying to see. I mean, that's cool and all, but like, what does Miles mean to Peter Parker as a whole? Like, is, is, is he his own dude or like... Spider-Man is a very pure idea. He represents compassion and perseverance and standing up for the little guy. The whole point of Spider-Verse is, one, to answer the question of what if Spider-Man was a giant dinosaur, but also to prove how spontaneous the values of Spider-Man are. No matter what universe they came from, all of these people independently came to the same conclusion. It's a really creative way of just reminding people that goodness and hope are inevitable everywhere. That's why Miles works so well as the face of the whole Spider-Verse brand, because he was kind of the first to prove this, to define Spider-Man as this symbol of shared values rather than just being one person. Before Miles, most Spider-Man variants were either just Peter Parker or a play on his name. There was never any question about whether they were Spider-Man because their stories always mirrored that of the original. They hit the exact same beats, just in a different context. Miles was the first Spider-Man in a mainstream universe that wasn't Peter Parker. Here was this kid who didn't share the same name or upbringing or skills or ambitions, and yet 
he still wore the same mask. His first series proved that Spider-Man wasn't about the jokes or the gadgets or a connection to any particular person or family. What really made him Spider-Man was the good values he had inside him before he'd even been bitten. The mask was just a promise to recognise those values and share them with as many people as he could. Miles got a lot of shit from people, both in universe and in the real world, for not being Peter Parker. But he prevailed, he established a broader definition of what it means to be Spider-Man and paved the way for all these other new and exciting characters. Okay, comic book Miles sounds awesome, but how does he contrast to the Spider-Verse Miles? They both represent the same thing, you know, overcoming self-doubt, not just blindly accepting what others have set out for you. Although Spider-Verse being a two-hour movie has to do that a lot faster, you know, it has to eliminate a lot of the roadblocks in the way of that conclusion. In the comics, Aaron figures out Miles' identity pretty early on in the story, and tries to lure his nephew into a life of crime. Around one third of the way into the series, Aaron accidentally offs himself when one of his Prowler gauntlets explodes. In his last moments, he doesn't encourage Miles, he says, you're just like me. Miles then has to shut out the voice of his family and grow beyond them. This is a very serialised arc, one that Spider-Verse can't just adapt beat for beat, and so the movie places Aaron's death right before the final act in the story, with Aaron bringing Miles closer to his goal instead. Miles is lifted up by his family, and it's more bittersweet than it is just completely fucking tragic. I I I. Lastly, what does Spider-Man mean to you? It's one thing to have compassion and a desire to do the right thing, but actually sharing that can take a lot of courage depending on the situation. If you're not a confident person, it's very easy to overlook your own values and let fear overwhelm you. And I guess that's why a lot of people become bystanders. They stand back and they do nothing because standing up for someone else can be terrifying. And so Spider-Man comes along and says, that's okay. It's okay for inaction to be your first response. Spider-Man's origin story acknowledges how easy it is to do nothing and how difficult it is to do the right thing. Now, the theme of the original origin story has kind of been lost in translation in a lot of the newer comics and movie adaptations. The movies take a lot of inspiration from the Ultimate comics, in which Peter is a nice, innocent kid, he's full of compassion, then he gets his powers, becomes an asshole, and then eventually he learns that, oh no, who I was before was actually important. He gets back on the path he was on at the beginning, but with a deeper understanding of his values and why they're so important. Now I've got nothing wrong with his interpretation, I love it, I think it's a good story about holding on to who you are in an ever-changing environment. The original version way back in the 60s was slightly different though. Right from the beginning, Peter's attitude is clearly flawed, even before he gets his powers. Through years of abuse at school, he's become so disillusioned with the idea of compassion and selflessness. He just doesn't care anymore, and understandably so. When he gets his powers, it only amplifies the selfish attitude he already had. When his uncle dies, it doesn't motivate him to go back, but rather to completely reevaluate the path he's been on his whole life. He makes a conscious choice to change his attitude, and spends the next 30 or so stories learning how to help others, learning how to share his gifts, while fighting his selfish impulses. The original story of Spider-Man, to me at least, is a story of a man fighting his own nature in order to do the right thing. Compassion doesn't come easy to him, but he tries his best, and in doing so he unlocks his own potential and becomes the kind, inspirational figure that we're all used to. That's the part of Spider-Man that really speaks to me, it's what inspires me to do better, and that's why it's so nice to see Miles keeping the spirit of that story alive today. Being a superhero is not in his nature, but by making a conscious leap of faith, he's able to rise up and reach his potential. His story takes that message from 60 years ago, the one that had almost been forgotten about, and applies it in a completely new cultural context, emphasising how universal this message can be. He honours these old stories while refusing to be tied down by them. And uh, I think that's kind of beautiful. Act 2 Anomalies. At this point, we know that Spider-Man, at least comically, has incorporated a wide range and variety of cultures, personalities, paralleled by tragic fates of being milkman. Uh, Turb, that wasn't supposed to make the script. My bad. What actually connects the Spider-Verse beyond the scope of interracial dating is death and a spider. Basically, in the structure of the Spider-Verse, take on the mantle of Spider-Man to have an uncle die and be bit by a spider. But worlds and depictions of Spider-Man are subjected to change. Canon is subjected to change, both in the comics and in the Western world. Cinematically and in the most popular depictions, comically of Spider-Man though, the main Spider-Man always have a story situated in New York, and they're always almost named Peter Parker, with the same baseline uncle death and spider bite story. Which makes Miles Morales such an enigma. He's a structural anomaly against a canon which needs to exist in Miguel's eyes. His dad hasn't died yet, sorry Miguel Orfana, and his realization of self is different given that he's black. That's 
a little different. A little. It's a little different. Eh, a little different. There's a thread between all these stories intertwined by fate. Even in his own canon, Earth 610, Miles isn't Spider-Man. He's never meant to be. And the story makes a point of that. It's not his fate to be. It's not his fate to do what Peter Parker does. But anomalies happen. The layering of gentrification, parental scrutiny, and snow bunny allegations in tandem with racial barriers of Western society adds to the ethos of surrealism Miles faces living in Brooklyn, New York. If you ever try to get a new pair of shoes on, on raffle ticket on the first day, if you're really into developing players in sports, or if you're one of those can end on a loss type of, type of silly guys, the ones that XQC is breeding six-year-old versions of. The, their rise or downfall all the time, I'm blamed for everything. I'm blamed for like, it's like, it's really, really lame. Understand that chance matters. Lotteries matter, meaning more than anything else. The luck of the cards determines how far you will go. In metaphorical reality, we're all dealt cards. Maybe you have a rich uncle who frequents the country clubs. Maybe you have a couple friends who trotted down the wrong path. Maybe you've been a child in a divorce which affected you negatively. Or maybe these cards you've dealt with have arbitrarily been labeled as illegal in the rule set of the game. Because like it or not, the game favors certain cards and certain suits. And Miles was given some of the worst cards imaginable. His fate was sealed. The worst card in the world. The end. However, the heart of the cards was still on his side. Is this a Yu-Gi-Oh metaphor? Yes, Exodia is the realization of self. So is Blue-Eyes White Dragon a Hitler Youth reference? Pew! Never do that shit again. This was a silly gun. It wasn't a real gun, YouTube description. It's just super silly. He <laughs> he, super silly. Question! In the stories about Miles Morales, why are we not introduced to Miles first? In the first or second movie, why, why are we not introduced to Miles first? This is purposeful! In the first Into the Spider-Verse, to really cement how much of an enigma Miles is, we start at the original anomaly. The Spider-Verse creates a frame of this world that's changing, that has so much dynamic characters that are all affected by differing experiences and chants. And, and I mean, the second movie wasn't really even focused on Miles, it was more of a Gwen point of view. Miles' story is one of a million inside of this superstructure of the Spider-Verse. But let's start at the original anomaly that affected Miles. The original anomaly is Miles pulling out number 42 in a school draft lottery. 42, and the same this universe it came from. No matter how smart, brave, strong, loyal, or ethical Miles is, this pathway of life was given to him out of pure luck. It seems like a lot of Miles' life is enveloped in layers of statistical anomalies we can find out happen way more often than just a spider bite. Meaning anything that happens outside of the bounds of his perceived fate, statistically, is an anomaly. This wasn't the first anomaly. Remember, anomalies only happen because systems allow it. Allow it to. Anomalies have existed for as long as a form of structure that dictates what canon should be has existed. Yes, fate constantly puts Miles into precarious situations, but his circumstance is juxtaposed by his luck. Bro just has really good luck. But to put an FU to this whole series, to put an FU to all the luck he was given, Miles isn't even comfortable with his perceived destiny of charter school prominence. In the first movie with his opening scene, we can see the contrast of comfortability between the charter schools Miles ends up in compared to his home area of New York. We see Miles running through Brooklyn, slapping stickers on public property, dapping up the homies, and like two bilingual tokens in an extracurricular class, speaking Spanish with the essays. Yeah. Yeah. He never taken a Spanish class, and he wrote that thinking he was, he was Shakespeare or something. It seems like Miles already knows who he is. He knows how he likes to have fun. He knows who his friends are. He knows where his hometown is. He knows he likes it. He knows how beautiful his community is and he knows who he wants around him. But it's time for the parents to tug on the string of fate. His dad, Jefferson Davis, has different plans about him. Stressing about the charter school, checking up on him with his grades, trying to get him away from his crime affiliated uncle. Jefferson understands fate in tandem with circumstance. These are not two things that you can get away from. They ate each other and then they have a baby and that baby is you. How was it like being from New York. So like um it is basically the same thing to y'all, but really I grew up I grew up closer to Philly than I grew up to, to New York. But it's it don't matter. Still northeast, whatever. Um you know what I'm saying? It's not like 
Growing up in New York is a very harsh environment because a lot of people are going to say the things to you that you might be self-conscious about in your mind and you hear it out loud. There's not much left up to question in New York. You kind of are constantly getting positive or negative kind of reinforcement out loud from your peers, your family members and strangers. So it kind of makes you very self-aware and it kind of just want it, it makes you want to mitigate how much people will say things out loud about you. So you kind of want to fit in in a way where you only get positive affirmations if people are going to say anything to you in front of people or around people or around other people. Um, So you kind of just, you start to kind of fit in and you protect yourself by kind of playing a role that typically gives you like a cool demeanor. Like you're cool, you're tough, you're in trend, you're in the know. So it kind of preps you to be kind of put together and self-aware how did that experience play into your worldview at first it kind of made me a little pretentious in a way because though a lot of people in new york are low income and we don't necessarily have the money to always put on status the little bit we do i feel like gives you kind of a chip on your shoulder so when you're outside of new york or you're looking at the world you're kind of <laughs> so when you're not in new york or you're looking at other people just like your worldview you kind of are holding other people to an expectation that you shouldn't have never even had for yourself like a lot of us kind of don't get to be like immature and silly kids because at some point you have to start like acting cool or like that's not like what you do after a certain period of time so i would be judging other people for things that i would I feel like they would get made fun of in New York. So it's like, why would you do that here? Because I know back home, this would have, you know, people would have made fun of you about this and that. And I had to realize like, that stuff does, does not matter. You're actually like a really strong person when you don't let all those other judgments get to you. And then I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable around me because I'm holding them to some standard that it's really made up. And you only find it important if you're around those people at the moment or that's just your values but they're not important universally hey (laughs) thank you and just to be clear jefferson is a black father he knows what will happen to a majority of people living in this area in fact as a cop he contributes to the unjust fate of the people living around him i feel like the most pivotal life experience of miles dad comes with his shortcomings we see it in his projections of success through his interactions with his son living vicariously a little specifically in the charter school draft when miles first beat the system by luck while miles is being embraced by his mother he stands there blank faced not knowing how to feel among the midst of kids crying and parents distraught that their children will never have the same chance to a viable education that Miles will. Of course, Miles doesn't know this, but his parents do. They've already been through that lived experience. This is important to note because the first Into the Spider-Verse movie references the draft and implies Miles won the lottery. So we can guess using media literacy and Miles' thoughts later throughout the movie that this is how it played out. There are already two very stark differences between Jefferson and Miles. Because Jefferson grew up in New York, he knows the terrors that poverty can bring. He knows what it's like to not have opportunity in a system that neglects you. And because his lived experience of marginalization has limited his avenues of economic stability, he decides to fit in the Western system through believing that these scarce gateways of opportunity need to be capitalized on because he tried to succeed outside the system and failed. Backed up by a conversation in the second movie around his failed business with his now deceased brother. The business may be a cover-up story for some type of crime thing. But that's not movie canon yet, so let's not jump the gun. Uh, okay. To be clear, Jefferson is a cop. He's fallen victim to the same bootstrap rhetoric a lot of older black people get sucked into because of the necessity for money and a perceivably stable life inside of North America. And at this point, Miles is comfortable in his situation around his friends, his culture, and sense of self. But he's still a child learning about the racial and economic severity that envelops his livelihood. The same frustrating experience with institutional oppression is going to be felt later on in his life, I'm sure. He simply doesn't have the same decades of frustrational experience with institutional oppression in the same way his dad does. At least not yet, because black boys get that shit quicker than a Range Rover in a school zone, I promise you. Quicker than wheelies on a kid named Bryson. But well, it just doesn't hold the same weight when you're not obligated to a parenting role. I mean, we hear his dad talking about the new foam coffee place that just opened, sucking in the paper skin people like flies. And Miles just sits there with a hand on his face in the most 
bored expression posse because he's lived this his whole life. He's lived through the active gentrification of New York. This is just life to him. But Jefferson may have a different experience with communality than Miles, given the age he was born in, even. Psst. Gen Z is currently living a very different life than your parents lived because of gentrification. Yeah. It's literally just a Monday for Miles. Because as we said, Miles is still affected by his environment. But at a social level, him riding in his dad's cop car on the way to a charter school isn't really the best display of black solidarity to the peers around him. We started saying ACAB at like three years old after our cousins got shot or jailed. It's, it's kind it's of- It's a lived experience. This social disparity can be seen through the kids outside his window recording him shouting world star. Okay, maybe not that extreme. <laughs> and taking pictures of Miles in the car on the way there. All topped off with Miles venting out his frustrations through pointing out how rigid the charter school rules are set, calling it elitist, stating he'd rather be at a normal school among the people. When his dad replies, the people, these are your people. I'm only here because I won that stupid lottery. Don't say that. You passed the entry test like everyone else. And when Miles sighs, we jarringly hear Jefferson's intentions being solidified through the system. You have an opportunity here. You want to blow that? You want to be like your Uncle Aaron? It's very telling how Jefferson acknowledges the effects of systemic racism and knows Miles can subvert this through his opportunities. He's trying to be a good black fellow. And because his circumstances in Brooklyn weren't the best, Jefferson has selectively chosen to mitigate conversations of marginalized trauma by shutting down his child's thoughts on elitist policy and Miles' overall comfortability with community. Because anomalies like Miles are manufactured instruments of Western policies, regulations, and purposeful philanthropic rhetoric to combat the aspects of oppression that people like us face in the modern world. Slavery was a canon event both in their world and our world. He's seen what the environment can do to people. He's seen what lengths his family and himself do in pursuit of living a comfortable life. So he's chosen to roll with the punches of discrimination and instead maneuver circumstance in the best way possible by taking the opportunities presented to him. Miles has seen what his environment can do to people. He's seen what lengths it affects his family and himself. Sorry, we had a, we had a hey, hey, hey member. So Miles has chosen to roll with the punches of enforced discrimination and instead maneuver circumstance in the best way possible by taking the opportunities presented to him. Cause what else could he do? We more? all make choices in life. Well, it doesn't feel like I have a choice. You don't. Miles doesn't have a choice. His destiny was set up for him because of his inherent anomaly, his first personal anomaly, his most vital wrongdoing that's affected his dad, his mom, his uncle, his friends, his internalized experience of neglect from his father that slowly forms a rift between the two and connects him to his then uncle and eventually gives him superpowers. His first anomaly wasn't the number 42, listening to Post Malone while you're black, or managing to have the least scuff sneakers in all of Brooklyn. His first anomaly is that he's black. I mean, it was hood. <laughs> that's the only way I can describe it. it, it the, thing, the thing about Trenton, and not to talk your ear off with historical stuff, but long story short, what had happened was once white flight started happening in like the, the 40s and the 50s or whatever, it's an old industrial city that never recovered from when all of the factories left and whatnot. So what these geniuses <laughs> decided to do is they made a deal with the state that said, all right, y'all can build all y'all state buildings down here. And a lot of others, I won't say any other state, because I think Harrisburg is like that too. That's the capital of Pennsylvania. But in a lot of other states, like they state buildings are like here, there, and everywhere, or whatever. But all of our state buildings are in one, they're all in Trenton. So the Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, Department of all of that, long story short, what that did was that created a condition where there's no tax revenue coming into the city because everything is either a state building a church or a parking lot you feel me when i say the whole city is hood i'm like i'm not I, like i'm i'm literally not there's li there is one neighborhood in trenton that is called hiltonia we call it the hilltop growing up if you lived on literally if you lived on top of the hill that was the boule that was the the black bourgeois you know whatever if you lived down the hill then you was hood so that's really like the only neighborhood in the whole city that you know where all the big houses and all the whatever and whatnot and, and a lot of those houses honestly have been converted into um, multi-families and whatever because get, nobody can afford it. That was my lens growing up was that until I went out to my grandparents, my grandparents, when I was like, I don't know, seven or eight years old, 
they moved out to the suburbs. They moved down to South Jersey. So I would go stay with them on the weekends a lot of times. That was like my first experience of seeing, oh, wow. So you mean to tell me y'all got two stories and y'all got a backyard and, you know, y'all mow y'all grass and all that kind of... That was my first time experiencing that. So um, in the beginning, it was... My scope was built on the idea that this is life. It's cop cars, it's dope fiends and dope dealers and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I was too young to really process and understand what I was saying, but you know, that's what I was accustomed to saying. So even now, that's why, you know, when I got older, it was easy for me. If it, well, not necessarily easy, but I didn't have a problem, you know, going to the quote unquote bad sides of town or whatever, because it's like, these are the people that I grew up around. And um, even though I wasn't technically when I started working in Philly, even though I wasn't technically from uh, any of those neighborhoods that I was in, they kind of picked that up that, you know, because I, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but you can tell based on the way that somebody carries themselves when somebody is, you know, real like tight, like, you know, they this, that, and the third. And I, I didn't carry myself that way. And that made people, you know, more open to me or whatever. And they just assumed, they just assumed that I was from around the way. And I had to say, nah, I'm from 30 minutes up the road. And they're like, ah, you know, y'all, y'all, y'all part of us anyway. So I say all of that to say, I grew up with the understanding that people are poor, not because of personal decision making but i didn't know the term for it back then now i know it's because of of the social framework i know that it's because of structural injustices because of systemic um racism i i i know the terminology for it now but back then all i knew was you know my mom is working two jobs and she's still barely making rent that's not her fault Right. So mm -hmm. that's the lens that I grew up with and that I have now is that the vast majority of the time, folk that's struggling is struggling due to factors outside of their immediate control. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and that all came from, you know, growing up in the environment that I did. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, I entirely get that. For me, it was kind of like, well, when I moved to the, the north side and the south side are structured very differently mm -hmm. here. Like the north side is basically... Uh, when I was younger, it was just a bunch of townhouses that they set up for refugees. And like my family was one yeah. of them. So I was in when I was younger, I was actually around a lot of black folk, like like because mm. because they just threw all the refugees yeah. over there. So like for for me, I didn't really know what the concept of poor was because all I was seeing was black people, right? Yeah, black right. People, same, like, same, 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 right. I, I I didn't know the concept of poor until I saw the suburb, until yeah. I saw what a two story colonial looked like for the first yeah. time, and I was like, oh, dang. Yeah. oh, so this how y'all living? So yeah, yeah. I, I know exactly. What, I I I matter of fact, I'll put it like so. As matter of fact, in one of my uh, and I, I I didn't mean to cut you off, but in one of my older videos, okay. I talked about how um uh, we lived in the projects when I was little. And, um, you know, nine times when people hear the term projects, the first thing they think of, you know, is the high, you know, the high rises, you know, the 20. I ain't living that. I lived in um in one of the row home units. Right. So we had two stories. We had a back door. We had all that kind of stuff. Growing up, we were the rich. <laughs> we were the rich kids because we ain't living in, in the high rises. Right. And on top of that, you know, my 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 grandparents and um and my dad, you know, he ain't he ain't lived with me, but you know, he basically my grandma basically talked his ear off about buying me whatever thing since I wasn't living with him. So, you know, ain't no no better. You you feel me? Like they living in a one story apartment, but I technically have a house, even though it's public housing. I, so I say that to say I get exactly what you're, what you're talking about. Why I did not understand the concept. I tell people this all the time. I did not realize I was poor until I went to college. That's when I realized just how um, destitute I was because now I'm with people that's it's like a whole new world, black, white, Asian, everything. That was when I realized, you know, the human question of meaningful existence is countered by how small and insignificant we are in the structural makeup of the universe.
the result of our species' unending search of self-imposed importance has festered into everything we know today. One thing we can't run away from as humans is structure. It fuels our interactions, our debates on humanitarian issues, our disagreements with fan castings. The universe contains a lot of structures that are unrelenting, unbiased, and unescapable. This is actually my favorite number, which is, I think that's a good sign. The signs in the background aren't the best, but the four, that is good. We knew gravity was a forced construct tethering us to the earth through canon events, like an apple falling on this silly little Englishman's head. Unless you're Michael Jordan, of course, you can't escape gravity, both literally and metaphorically. However, this force imposed by objects millions of times bigger than us sets the stage for objective galactical interaction, embodied by celestial monoliths like the sun, the moon, Kassar's black holes, Beyonce world tours. Her gravity is one of mystery, to say the least. But humans are resilient creatures. It seems that sometimes our existence is made to overcome certainties of powers inflicted on us. So, just because Gravity is objectively unrelenting, does it mean we shouldn't fly? Does it mean we shouldn't strive to find what's out there in the Milky Way? Structure is limiting. To prevail, sometimes we have to be above it. We want to feel like we are the main actors in a system where we're insignificant specs. And because of that, we decide that the sky, or whatever beyond it, is too vast to be left alone. We create rudimentary wings that fail, blimps that fail, airplanes that fail, then succeed. And eventually, galactical voyages to bodies we've theorized about for centuries, no matter who might have won the space race. It was definitely the Russians. We just can't be limited in our never-ending quest to find new ways to bend the universe to our whims. But this innate force of change, the ability that consciousness has given us, the ability to mend reality, as beautiful as it is. For most of human existence, it's kept us away from understanding the actual laws of the universe, from understanding ourselves. Humans have created as many arbitrary laws as we have overcome. Sometimes we fight our own perceivably unmendable laws. If you thought the sun was the center of the universe in the 1700s, you might be deemed a heretic, ostracized, revoked of societal connection, and in the worst case, killed for it. If you thought finding connection with outsiders foreign to your world as an extension of human connection and generosity, you and your people might have been taken as slaves, exploited, wiped off the face of the earth, defined as a savage. If you thought finding connection with people of the same sex or people of color was a realistic model for human connection in the 1900s, the laws of rebranded religion would have categorized you as inhuman, an anomaly, one that has lost their connection with their biologically imposed existence of washing dishes or going to war. Legally, how do you marry three-fifths of a person? Our laws, be it galactical or social, have defined what we cannot do, where we cannot be, when we can interact with the universe and when we can partake in society within a bounds of circumstance throughout human history. Without structure, we'd be lost. Without the sun, we'd be spiraling through the Milky Way, aimless, devoid of life, warmth, water, conscious meaning, but socially, the rigid laws of militaristically imposed dominance, social scrutiny, and educational teachings, these same laws that we've imposed on ourselves objectively play the biggest role in human life, create a framework of society that limits and empowers people 
with or without wealth, with or within the Western world, man or woman. Without them, where would we be? We think ourselves intricate, divine beings blessed with consciousness and moral compasses. Our personal structural existence in the cosmos of humanity is as limited as arbitrary laws allow it to be. The sun, although cold, unforgiving, and unstable, is needed. It gives us life under structure until we find a new artificial way of creating a hub of energy. It's something we humans can't yet overcome. In the same way our hierarchies of humanic structure like governments and companies are unforgiving, unstable, we perceive them as something needed, something we just have to suck up and overcome. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Miles' origins are rooted in a number of anomalies, but later we're introduced to the most powerful one of them all, Spot. A nigh invincible reality warping, dimensional hopping, godlike being, who like a Twitter user that uses noodles as a dog whistle, gets their power off of hate. Spot, the antagonist of the second Spider-Verse movie, shows up as just a little silly guy at first who doesn't even have the ability to rob a convenience store properly. I mean, there isn't really a how to rob a store for dummies essay, so I do get how he was a little confused. Spot very clearly is a super villain in the same way that Elon Musk thinks he's played of. First things first, step one of mad villainy is being a threat. So although Spot has these gravitational warping powers, which would, if given to anyone else be an Avengers level threat to the universe. It's just silly on this dude cause like look at him. Even his character design is like, like, okay? It's giving Amish nightmare a little bit. Let's see why an Amish person would be scared of this. That's very scary if you're Amish, probably. Probably. I hope I'm not being racist to Amish. Spot can't fight. He's goofy as hell. Not really Batista levels of intimidating. Basically, he looks like he'd snap his fingers and say, Oopsie daisies. When he drops a carton of eggs in public. Very specific. Rose. Narratively speaking, Miguel O'Hara is 10 times the villain Spot has ever been throughout the duration of this film. This is because Spot, formerly named Jonathan Owen, isn't like Miles' uncle Prowler, who became a villain through his treacherous experience of hopelessness. He's a world-renowned scientist who was so good at their job, he was assisting in creating a reality-warping trans-dimensional device, which is capable of bringing in bodies from other dimensions. You have to be pretty good at your job to get assigned to that. And this is the same device that brought the same genetically altered spider from Earth-42 over to Miles Morales' dimension. Yes, he and a group of other scientists brought the spider which bit Miles into this universe. Could you call Spot the first anomaly though? Nah. He's one of many inconsistencies present in the structural world of oppression. For anomalies have existed for as long as structure has. I mean, what is structure really? Now the Spider-Verse's sense of structure to an extent differs from Western hegemony, be it in its specific discursive laws, but they have an overlap in the sense of institutional policing and inconsistency the things that are supposed to be a certain way is a conservative talking point based on protecting cis hetero white men, oppressing women and creating racialized divides which is a conspicuous, conspicuous, conspicuous experience felt in the western world. The thing is though, Spot isn't like Miles. He's a white, well off, distinguished scientist. Did they say he was distinguished? Well if you're working on a project with the ability to change the way we perceive reality as a whole, I'd say you bring your most distinguished little guys to help you accomplish the task with ease. And the company he works with is literally a billion dollar one with the amount of resources to hire the most important scientists in the world. Right. I'm always right. And annoying. Oddly enough though, with all of Spot's structural advantages, being having a high-rated job, a vice foothold in the ethos of the science world, and not having to pull a number out of a lottery to have academic privilege, he makes one mistake, being warping his own reality, a reality which is benefiting him for the worse, essentially being turned into an anomaly from a place of privilege, unlike villains who have become villains due to structural normalcy, like the Prowler. But Spot is stripped of everything that gave him a happy life, and turned into 
a black hole of regret and despair. Now metaphorically, warping the system of privilege in the western world would lead to people like Spot being born. Oh, he's doing political metaphors. Let me cook you little quacker. Why do you always hurt me? I love you. You actual sadist. Structural priority in the western world differs along with your race, salary, or gender. Say you want a new house in California, so you're at the bank and you have negative $50 in your bank account. They're not gonna give you that loan. You don't have the privilege of wealth, so you can't get that loan. But let's say you have the money, but you're black. Well, thanks to President Franklin D. Lano Roosevelt, known for hating Asian people and instilling white pride with lynchings and scalpings, scalping indigenous people, that's what he did. He would he would be happy when you scalped indigenous people. And you going to the bank in LA and trying to, trying to buy stuff, you can thank this guy for not allowing you to buy stuff too. Due to the social and legal impacts of his policies like the New Deal, this resulted in racist restrictions seen across California. These federal practices and many others were reinforced at state and local levels, including here in San Leandro, where African Americans were intentionally excluded from buying homes and renting. Which literally split California into a colored map that bankers and property owners used to restrict black people from getting loans. This is also why we can track income disparity today in these same areas of the map. And if you're a woman, you couldn't even have your own bank account till pretty recently, so I don't think you're in this conversation, really. In short, race, finances, and gender is king, and this system of priority extends further than just housing laws. It affects the schools you go to, the people you interact with, your jobs. Being white, well-off, and a notable scientist puts Spot in a position of power Miles has never felt. So to him, Miles is just the diversity hire that took his job. Miles is the problem with the structural balance of power Spot has been benefiting from for his whole life. Spot is an allegory for conservative thought. Because Spot, like conservatives who throw tantrums about affirmative action in the United States, which is what allowed Mile to attend his school, by the way. He blames Miles, not the team that brought him to the laboratory, not the leader of the operation, Kingpin, who purposefully made him go through all these dangerous, borderline illegal test practices. Instead, he blames the black 15-year-old boy who coincidentally got bit by a spider. Even though he was the one who created the anomaly, he and his scientist buddies brought the spider in, but is much easier within the systems of Western privilege to utilize the barriers of exploitation which benefit him to fathom how such a system of priority could be flawed. Delving into outright racist rhetoric of this is how things should be. Well, no, that's not how things should be. Spot warped the reality of the Western world literally and metaphorically. American hegemony, American systems of priority are a set of exploitative systems which benefit white, rich, people, but anomalies happen. Although Spot is in a place of privilege in capitalist society, America still exploits its people. It doesn't really care if Joe from down the block gets fucked over as long as its benefit is mostly felt from the white majority and it's bailing out its companies. Lastly, because Spot brought this spider into the universe, he feels contempt with the idea of Miles being a benefactor of his actions. Why must he suffer while Miles thrives, he thinks. I mean, the rest of his peers, family, and friends thrive, but Miles only thrives because I give him the ability to thrive. Almost like Spot believes Miles shouldn't have ever even had the chance to thrive because of his circumstance of oppression. This plays into the rhetoric of conservative men going to immigrants are taking our jobs. Let's make This is a message to Spot. And, and, and everyone like Spot out there, all my Spotty little guys. Anomalies have existed for as long as systems of priority have. I worked at Alchemax. I ran a test on this collider that brought a spider here from another dimension. 42. It's home dimension. It escaped, and it bit you. My spider made you Spider-Man. What? You ran through the cafeteria. You hit me with a bagel. Ah! I've hit a lot of different villains with a lot of different food. You make your flippy little sassy jokes. Everyone loves them. But no one knows what it feels like to be on the other side of them. I'm just trying to You're like, just now experiencing the harsher end of it after benefiting from it for so long. So in your anger, you revert back to the system of priority which fucked you over. Sorry, no apologetics here. Were you gonna disagree with me? No. Good. Me, 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 me. What's interesting though is how Spot exists as an anomaly in white supremacy. He's something that shouldn't happen. He should be benefiting from these systems. Parallel the line and you'll see that in the same way Miles is an anomaly. He's benefiting from these systems too. That just shouldn't be happening. Well, somewhat. I really reverberated with his experience of maneuvering through black masculinity and mm -hmm. like kind of kind of the anomalous nature of it. And uh specifically the, the structural nature of it. Uh, because 
I'm benefiting from a lot of aspects that I should have been like barred from, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, it's kind of jarring to an extent with like survivor's guilt. Yeah. But do you ever think we're benefiting from a force that we shouldn't be? I used to. And what I do, what I think is more accurate now is we're benefiting from a system that identified our potential and put us in a position to extract value and capital from. Um, so like the system is not designed with us in mind, except for when you show the system some type of value capacity, the system will then pluck you out. You're one of the good ones. Come here. Mm -hmm. Um, do the do these videos, nigga. It will we'll reward you. And so like there, that's it's so like because the survive it's it's not even survivor. Like I'm I've started to step away from survivor's guilt because that's too me focused. And what I'm what I'm trying to do more so is like one, like just keeping it a buck, being uh what's the word? Appreciating the 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 opportunity and the blessing, you know, to be able to wake up on a Friday morning, run some errands and then come talk to you versus like a couple of years ago we're waking up, dropping my kids off before 8 a.m. so I can be at my job. And, you know, rushing through rush hour traffic uh, to get back to them, you know, not being able to do sports or after school activities or things for them because I couldn't pick them up in, in a timely fashion. Like that was like today my kid is going to soccer, you know what I'm saying? Because I can go get them early because I have nothing else to do. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's that. There's just the general human instinct to be like, right? The survivor's guilt, I don't think is overly useful because... It doesn't really help me change or act in a, a ethical way. It just makes me feel bad. So instead, I've recognized, hey, I've been put in this position, not just because of, not specifically because I'm so great, but because the system identified me as useful. And it's exploiting, it's exploiting my, it's exploiting that reality of mine. And so my responsibility is to use this opportunity to not waste it on my own end, but to create the same thing for other people and then to agitate within the system to make it to make the system as sick as possible to, re to, to resist as much as possible and so like, i think my whole movement movement but the whole thing the way i've moved i should say is clearly indicative of that you know what i'm saying i could have very easily made my bo burnham video 10 times over the last two years and be at a million already right but instead I've been agitating as much as possible while maintaining success and explicitly trying to create pathways for other people and advocating for politics and the ideas that I think are being removed from the conversation. So it's 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 a lot of things. But to try to sum it up better, we're not lucky. We're just in a different part of the machine. You know, well, we are lucky, right? But we're we're in a different part of the machine. Like we haven't escaped it. We fit still well within it. We just serve a different role that happens to be less but less mind breaking and awful than the you know some of my cousins back in Chicago, some of your folks back in uh which part of the Canada you in Edmonton. Ottawa Edmonton. Edmonton yeah yeah you know yeah yeah, yeah that's kind of something I've been trying to fathom too especially with especially with moving out and especially with being like one of the only ones of my one of the only people in my familial circle that has the opportunity to like you know work from home and take time off and do stuff but whereas like my, my aunties are always calling me and they're like you're doing big things da 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 and i can't really i can't really give that experience to them because they have a very dis disjointed i guess experience with the aspect of being black in the western world because mm -hmm. they literally were in South Sudan for most of their lives. You know, there was that whole civil war that happened in genocide that forced them to flee over here. So for me to be doing all of this, that's like, I, I'm not even like- 10 worlds away. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even yeah. at like a middle-class salary yet. Like my tax bracket is still very like higher income, lower class. So like right. I, it, it it's very jarring to like reach like that. And then that be like the pinnacle of excellence in my family yeah. you know and yeah, still really... not being able to like provide or anything so uh i do get that but but also there's an ass there there's a structural anomaly i guess with like uh your your kids right mm -hmm. and like pointing that out to them 
and like i i don't really when when i talk to my sisters about things i do and everything um uh i'm oh, by the way for context i'm kind of like the the dad of the house and mm -hmm. like um uh even for Father's Day, my sister drew this silly little photo of me. Oh, it wow. was it was awful, but I was <laughs> it, it, it looked I, I was yeah no it. it it speaks to yes that's valuable yeah. yeah and I've had to like raising raising kids I've kind of had to do it since I was like since my dad left in like grade five you know yeah. and I had to look after my little siblings and everything and like make sure they have those nuanced talks of racism they have those nuanced talks of trauma. They have those nuanced talks of like misogyny with me. And like, even now I'm still unpacking to the point where like, I was dribbling a basketball in my front yard. And my sister's like, well, oh, I want to play basketball with you. That blew my fucking mind. I was like, you want to play? I always thought it would be like my little <laughs> brother or something. Right. But my little sister is now out going to the court with me when I need like my, my mental health breaks and like shooting ball with me. And I, that's like jarring to, to me. I guess because of this framework of patriarchy I fit into. And yeah. it's it's very hard, I guess, raising black kids ethically. Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard raising kids ethically, period. To be yeah. to be generous to all yeah. the the all the all the white devils that I hate so much, of course, as as, as is well known in canon here in mm -hmm. Cornbread too. But but it's hard in general to raise kids under capitalism and like in the way our societies are structured. Because like if you want to take, you know, this is broad, right? Please don't like, please don't cite me too tough as I get into some anthropology because I'm not an anthropologist. But like, you know, humans weren't meant to live the way we live right now. We were meant to live in like large family groups and to have like kids be able to collect together and be loud and obnoxious and childish versus now. I got this actually from Lindsay Ellis talking to her because she had a baby. Mm. baby's gorgeous and you know she was talking about like you know we force kids to be quiet and like stand sit still which is like completely unnatural to them and we do that because we've created a society that is inhospitable to what being a human child is regardless of race and then you add the race on top of it for us in particular and the consequences of these things become more dire i just talked to um olay and i talked to bp earlier this month because um, I'm doing a video on the prison industrial complex and uh, abolition. And uh, when I was talking to Olay in particular, we, uh, we were talking about how there was an era, you may have missed it because you were younger and in Canada, but there was like a, a year or two where every other week on Facebook, a parent was like filming themselves, disciplining their child. And that discipline would be a spanking. They would be uh, berating their children. They would be giving their children ridiculous haircuts or ridiculous outfits and forcing them to go to school. And it was just really just abuse. We were just filming ourselves abusing our children in the name of like tough love and showing discipline, et cetera. And there's a psych there's a there's an anti-black like pathology in that because for black parents, right? You know. There is there's the awareness of how the world perceives us and how thus the world will perceive our children. There's a fear where if we don't do enough to discipline our children, that our children will be at a higher risk. And then there's also a shame when those children do like working in as a teacher and and then like social work when, you know, little such and such gets caught stealing or something worse because I have had a lot of worse. Right. Mom comes into court. Mom has to take a day off from work to come into court for their child, which is already a whole other set of problems. First thing she says is, I've tried everything I could. I disciplined my child. My child has this, my child has that, et cetera. Like, cause it's important for this woman, sometimes, you know, man, this father, mother, I should say, to prove that they're doing what they're supposed to do according to this set structure of appropriate behavior that is really not healthy or normal for children, especially black children. And so the desire to like prove that we go overboard and we put videos on Facebook, like look this up when you make sure you look this up when you do this. There was a whole like set of videos. There was a whole trend on Facebook. My son been cutting up in class. So I'm cutting his hair and they cut like, <laughs> chunks out of kids head. And it's been like, all right, you going to school looking like that tomorrow, which is just going to create a, a situation of shame and embarrassment for the kid and that shame and embarrassment is supposedly what makes them act better but really all it does is sever the bond you know and ruin it mm -hmm. um, I
Double consciousness, a concept in social philosophy, referring originally to a source of inward tuneness, putatively experienced by African Americans because of their racialized oppression and devaluation in a white dominated society. W. E. Du Bois innovated this concept to build on the ideas of romantic transcendalites like Goethe, Ralph, Where's Waldo, Emerson, and that everything bagel, Hegel. Maddie Merlin wrote that joke. The Dr. Doofenshmirtz's used double consciousness to examine the divisions between the divine, the natural world, and commercial society. Society. Tragically, Emerson poised people are inevitably pulled away from transcendence and pushed down to society's material, rational existence. After all, the worldly was an essential part of one's living life. One part of your identity will always dominate the other. In contrast, W. E. Du Bois grounded double consciousness in the lived experience of black people in 20th century America, the era of Jim Crow segregation, in the strivings of Negro people. Double consciousness encompasses the overwhelming consequences of white stereotypes of blackness, the violent separation of black people from acceptable American life and the dissonant beings of those living at once as Africans and Americans. Or more consciously, in Du Bois's words, double consciousness feels like always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body. Double consciousness is survival when your humanity is made invisible. Now, the real question is, since the divisions of race we face are an illusion made reality by a world which propagates these ideas as structure. How would that affect the social life of a marginalized person? Well, they'd have to put on a mask. I'm gonna push this theory a little further. Excuse me, let me apologize. This extends to human subjective experience. Remember, under structure, because nothing is inseparable from its emplacement. Do you know what it feels like to be a man, a woman, black, white, Eastern Asian, Western Asian, an arsonist in the year of 2023? There's a social fabric of complacency where fitted into as people, it can be as big as how your parents influenced you, how you interacted with family, how teachers fostered your growth, how a sport changed your life, or as perceivably little as the lunch you had to hide because of the smell, the attire which had you called out in front of your family, the report cards you proudly displayed or hid. However you choose to move in this fabric of social relation is entirely up to you, which is why we have such a jagged universal live experience of trauma. Like we've all lived the same lives before, right? Your first rejection from a job offer turning into a million a dream job you wanted but had to leave behind because of financial securities, toxic relationships with siblings or cousin turned positive after you mature and realize THC cures all. But I'm also different from you. You're different from me. Although our ethoses of reality are in the same canon, we're following two different plot points under a set of circumstances set up before the notion of existence even came into question. So how do you live your life? I am here with Ali Sunvia. Hi. Right? Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ask me that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so basically, I thought this would be a good conversation about a good dialectical conversation about um, race and gender and survivability and conformity all in conjunction in Edmonton. And I saw a video that she did with the uh, foreign and it was fucking amazing. And uh, so you were like at the top of my list when I was thinking about this. So I live in Edmonton, Alberta, right? I'm conservative as hell. And like black has been like a detriment to me living uh, more so just not seeing depictions of my own culture with the erasure of Black history with immigrant parents too, which has made me feel like I had to conform in order to survive, I guess, or really reap the rewards of the model minority. And I never really dissected how my environment played into a role on how I moved in my area until I took my first socio class until at like 17. Like, uh, so like, have you unpacked that? And how was the environment you grew up in and internalizations of race, be it through racism or et cetera, played a role in your life? Yeah, it's something that I don't think I really like reflected on that much until I got much older as well. Not that I'm old, I'm still really young, but <laughs> hopefully I'll reflect more on it as I grow as well. But I definitely noticed a change when I used to live in a city called Markham and Markham is like stereotypically known as like full of Asians, like it's just East Asians there. Um, and so I was never like really that conscious of like my race there. But then when I moved to Oakville, which at the time was like very white and it still is quite white um, today, it was like all of a sudden I felt so much less um, desirable or like 
fitting into like beauty standards and I felt like oh wait my parents act in this way but everyone else's parents do this why do they all wear like yoga pants and go to gymnastics and I'm not doing that I'm doing like piano or other like traditionally East Asian things and so I definitely felt like a much greater um, pressure to like conform just moving to like a different city even though it was only 40 minutes away. I think it's just so interesting how like cities that are like so close to each other have like such different like racial segments. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I kind of feel, felt that too, because uh, when I moved here, uh, I moved here as a refugee, first of all. Uh, and then I moved in the north side of uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, and that was like incredibly black, like this big Sudanese community. And then I moved south and it was... Uh, It was like way more white because that's kind of south is where more so the suburbs are. Well, north the north side of Edmonton is being gentrified too, but that's another conversation. But um, uh, but Canada uh kind of gives us a gray zone in which races are kind of like made up. You know, they exist as like spears of invisible pressure that kind of push you away from like your personal ties to culture. And this happened with like with me with like the food I ate. I'd like come to lunch with like this canister or something get roasted for it not coming to lunch anymore with that my hair like i had to i i didn't have to but i felt pressure to cut my hair because teachers were saying it looked unprofessional in like grade five and i cut off all of my locks wow. yeah job opportunities you know the hiring process and things like that you have to kind of conform in tandem with the depiction of your culture that's imperative to better forms of treatment in the West specifically, in order to survive. Uh, When talking about this experience, where have you felt it the most? I guess, like, if you're talking about conforming to, like, what's it called, the stereotypical, like, image of your culture, it definitely have to be, like, academics, just because, like, East Asians are stereotyped as, like, really doing well in school. And so... I mean, I got it from my parents, obviously, because there is some truth to it being like within the culture, especially with like immigrant families. But I also felt it very often from like other kids who would be like, oh, wow, you must be really good at math or like, oh, you're going into humanities. Why aren't you going into like science or engineering? And it's like, I I like the humanities a lot more. And I'd always get questions like, oh, are your parents OK with this? Or like, Oh, my my teachers would also say like, oh, but you're so good at math and stuff. And yeah, I definitely felt that in school a lot, I think. And um, I do recognize that that's a more that's like not as bad, quote unquote, of a stereotype in general to like have to like conform to versus, I don't know, like maybe what more like black communities have to do um, because we get like what I think a lot of people call the good bad stereotypes whereas i wouldn't a lot say of there's like, a good bad like, yeah i know <laughs> yeah like, yeah yeah i i get what you mean though like um more so uh when you talk about like the literal definition of model minority like uh yeah i get it from that sense but i just want to reaffirm you in your experience and say like no it's still fucking patronizing <laughs> it's still fucking patronizing that should, should never okay. happen yeah what uh has race ever been a problem in friendships or relationships and like i'm not gonna lie fetish fetishization uh goes hard in edmonton like white girls know two things starbucks and race play i'm just kidding but uh, anyways (laughs) me being me me being black has been like intimidating to a lot of people in my life and i kind of felt that more so in my youth whereas like when i grew older i could kind of combat that with like personality but when i was younger i didn't really even know or have a sense that I was black. I was just like, uh, I'm just walking around, you know? So I've had to find a lot of ways of mitigating that anxiety, either through like charisma conversations or in professional settings. Uh, have you had that same experience? I think um, something, and this goes back to kind of what I mentioned before, I felt like really insecure about like how I fit into beauty standards, but I didn't. I wasn't even aware that the beauty standard I was like, feeling so insecure about um was like so white until I grew up later and really reflected on it but I just like I felt really undesirable because I didn't have blonde hair or like I wasn't I didn't have like Eurocentric features and I just wanted so bad to look like them and that definitely affected my confidence in getting into friendships with people um or even going after maybe someone that I thought was attractive um and I can't lie like even today you know I still even if 
tons of people online tell me oh you're you're like attractive or whatever it still doesn't quite get over my worry or my insecurity about looking at like other white girls online that people call attractive as well and thinking well I'm still not as attractive as them and I think a lot of like white people I guess get upset about that um because they're like oh what what are you talking about like people are calling you attractive why are you trying to like make this fake hierarchy in your head like it's it's all in your mind and it's like well if you grow up watching movies where the popular girls are always white with blonde hair (laughs) well you wouldn't you would understand and i do entirely don't that kind of made me that made me mad don't let them gaslight you (laughs) that's not it's not it's not fucking made up okay like you know how like mitski talks a lot about how she if she like dates a white man she's always worried that he's going to like leave her for like a white girl and it's like Mm -hmm. i definitely like understand where she's coming from no i entirely get that i've had i i I, if i get a conversation with the most fetishization i could go into like 12 different stories but there's been a lot oh man oh uh, get into like one of them uh okay the first person i ever dated this was when i was like getting more like out of my comfort zone right uh this Hmm. was like uh after high school uh when my parents were like my parents are still immigrant parents at the end of the day they're like you're going to school you're doing your classes you're doing your extracurriculars whatever else is not allowable like okay yeah that was just the life i lived so college i had more of an open door to actually date so like um and I dated the first person I saw. Criteria <laughs> not the, for choosing a partner. Yeah, yeah. Not the best, not the best idea. Because um, love at first sight too literally. Yeah, way too literally. And then um uh, I I was actually I was welcomed into their home. So uh thank thankful for them because they they tried, I guess. But um uh their relatives, uh I got called the N-word a couple times oh. by the I was fetishized by my partner a lot and it was just like not the best relationship and this was all because like I didn't even understand the ramifications of my race in a relationship until I got into a relationship because I like watching rom-coms and I like watching like you know like the white boys that be like delivering letters and shit yeah. <laughs> like I was I was trying to I was trying to be on that shit too I was trying um, to do that too but um uh yeah apparently um this this kind of goes into the conversation of hyper masculinity uh, with mm. black men specifically. And uh, I felt that a lot throughout my life, like I just said, through my relationships and through, uh, I guess, the extracurriculars I picked too, like basketball. And like I would teeter away from like the more things that were outside the model uh, minority kind of thing, because I was like, mm. I wanted to be like popular. So like um, the only kind of weird thing I did was drama, but and I really enjoyed drama. Drama was like when I was like, okay, I kind of like I, I I like acting on stages and I like doing all of this, and I shouldn't let I guess my internalizations of hyper masculinity block myself from that. Which is not the conversation I had in my head. It was more simple. It was more like haha, drama fun. Now I act, but I'm not <laughs> <laughs> like. Like when I unpack that now, now I could see uh, in that forum, that's how I thought about it. And um, uh, so basically with the cultural depictions of uh, um, hyper femininity, um, how is that with you? I think about it a lot, especially because I think about it a lot because as a woman online, like if you just show your face online, it kind of invites comments, even if you never asked for it. Um, and people are just going to have certain opinions based on how you look and it's kind of it kind of gets frustrating sometimes if I don't know if I want to like dress feminine but then at the same time I'm making video essays which is like intellectual or whatever and it's not associated with like dressing feminine and caring about beauty Um, and so sometimes it can feel like a struggle where it's like do I have to like give up one more for the other um in order for people to like take one of those areas seriously and I honestly like I still haven't figured out like a way to like completely balance it in my head I think that's one of the reasons though why I will still 
deliberately dress up how I want and still post like photos of my outfits or whatever on Instagram while also doing YouTube because I really want people to understand that like hyper femininity and like doing something serious quote unquote is not mutually exclusive and then this goes into uh I guess intermingling of uh culture uh basically with cultural appropriation uh with the reclamation of traits that were kind of stripped from you because of Western stereotypes. And I feel like that's very prevalent in the experience of uh, minority people and marginalized people specifically. Um, uh, And I feel like there's ultra, ultra bad forms of this and good forms of this. So we're going to go into the good first. Okay. Um, okay. Cultural nuance. I mean, cultural nuance is kind of a tough an uncomfortable conversation to have sometimes because I feel like more so at least in Canada at least where I live uh in a place where we've been deprived of our culture and our culture has been erased um if you're taking the literal definition of cultural appropriation and that kind of fits to me because I am a southern Sudanese immigrant you know I'm an African refugee black culture isn't really mine to claim it's something that I was like forced into which I I love being black but like it's something that I was forced into. And mm. Canada also indulges in this dance of uh, Black glamour like the rest of the world. Because a lot of our own um, is erased or not really systemically viable. And I get, and I see that, I see a lot of intermingling in culture through survivability by uh, minorities here. I think the majority of my friends, like when I moved to the South Side, a good 70% of them were like Sudanese, Filipino, and Middle Eastern. And we had like, positive forms of appropriation through survivability i guess where i would like go to their house we'd eat each other's food they'd come to my house we eat each other's food i'd teach them a bad word in my language for white people they teach me one in theirs uh, <laughs> so um what has positive cultural appropriation look like to you before we get into like the negative side of it okay one of one of like the basic surface level ones is just food because I think food is like really easy for people to get on board with. And mm. if there was anything ever positive that was said about Chinese culture, it was Chinese food. Like even if you look back in like early 2000s movies, the stereotype is always like, let's get Chinese takeout because it's so yummy and so convenient. I mean, like, let's ignore the fact that it's not authentic Chinese food, but it's still, I guess, like positively reinforced some sort of image of Chinese culture in some way. I think also... The resurgence of like Chinese or just like East Asian uh, fashion and makeup has also been helpful in kind of like redefining beauty standards in another way as well because it's like oh you don't have to like wear your eyeliner or do your makeup in just this way that was made for eurocentric features like it's been really helpful for me honestly as someone who doesn't have double eyelids to have makeup tutorials now from people who have monolids just like me and I didn't have that before like eastern um, makeup was kind of like more popular here so that's also been something I've been glad to see people take on even if they're not you know, East Asian. And there's also um cultural appropriation with the, this is the more negative conversation, the reclamation of traits that were stripped from other groups. And now you're kind of reinforcing it, that negative image of another group in another way. And it's been prevalent through people like, I guess if I pull up like uh, an example of a, a, a Black culture one, uh, Nicki Minaj had a whole like Chun-Li era. And that's yeah. like, that was like, that's cultural appropriation at its worst, you know, because he was she was flaunting an image of a an orientalized image of Eastern Asian people. And then Lil Uzi, too, where Lil Uzi, in order to, I guess, combat uh, aspects of hypermasculinity that he was boxed in because he didn't really agree with the rapper term, he instead decided to um, uh, delve into uh, hyper femininity. So then uh, he started co-opting Eastern Asian uh, stereotypical um, things too, like Hirajuku. I don't even know if I said that right. Anime and like that kind of image to kind of soften his image. It's like, we know what you're doing. Like in, in terms of gender expression, um, I think it's a nuanced conversation I have uh, that people want to, I guess, detract from images of their own culture that's instilled in them. But um sometimes this does lead to cultural appropriation like Nicki Minaj and Lil Uzi. In your uh, ethos 
of cultural appropriation? What have you seen? This is not appropriation of mine. I was just thinking about it because you were giving examples of like um, Eastern Asian appropriation in Black culture. But the reverse of that is like a lot of East Asians um, who get into like hip hop or rap, but then they like try to be gangster or they try to be like hardcore. And just like how Lil Uzi thought that he would be more, I guess, softer if he went into like East Asian culture. I think a lot of East Asian men, especially who feel like we're feminized, um, will take on like hip hop or get into that kind of music because they think that will make them more masculine. Um And it's really interesting to see that because I don't see nearly as many East Asian women getting into like hip hop or rap just because of like that, uh, just because of that reason, because they don't feel like they have some sort of masculinity to have to prove. And obviously that's really problematic because a lot of these East Asian men, they'll get into like rap and they'll like rap everything. They'll, They'll try to like dress up in that sort of like fashion. But when it comes to like actual black issues, or like acknowledging uh, issues that matter to the community, they kind of like step out or they're like, oh, wait, 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 no, it's not that bad. Or, oh, that's not how it actually happened. And so I think that's like definitely surface level appreciation of the culture, which is, I guess, appropriation in a bad way. In terms of like my own culture, I guess, I don't know if this counts, but something that I guess I notice is when people use like, a Chinese accent to signify that you're being like dumb or that you're somehow like how do I put this it's like it's kind of like uh, when you use the accent of being a foreigner and it's like oh I'm like not as intelligent or I'm not as or I'm like really cheap and I don't care as much about like how I, I am perceived by other people actually no scratch that I don't know where I was going with that you ever just like talk and you're like wait why yeah, no, that? I think you were going somewhere with that because accents are a really big um form, at least in the professional sense, in yeah. academia and like what I've had to go through personally. Accents are definitely a detriment to success. Like, yeah, it's not yeah, not the best out here for us. Keep going. I think something that I've realized is I don't even know myself where it started from because I'm like I was born in Canada. I'm like very disconnected, honestly, from like east asian east asian culture like people who like just like live and grew up there but um ever since like k-pop and like anime and all that kind of became really popular my parents told me like did you see like all the chinese youth now look exactly like koreans or something and it's like i think it's because um there's always this sense of tension within even like the popular east asian countries like korea japan and china where like chinese people at least for me and i know other chinese people feel this way it's like korea and japan their culture is like seen as really like fun and we want to adopt it um whereas chinese culture is kind of like oh haha you guys eat dogs and you have like a dictator and blah blah and so chinese culture gets kind of like memed on But it doesn't get memed on if it looks like Korean and Japanese culture. And so I think that's why like Douyin makeup got really popular. It originated from China, but then people started calling it Korean beauty because that's kind of what people put nice looking makeup from East Asia under that like umbrella term. And so I guess that's a example of like Chinese people appropriating like Korean culture, but in like a way for survival i didn't actually know about that thank you so much for sharing that with me but uh secondly um you mentioned uh a disconnect from uh culture and uh i get that too because i'm a first generation immigrant like i moved here when i was like five to seven so i still know my culture i have like no memories of my where i used to live but i still know my culture my family still indulges heavily in my culture um, uh, we still speak our language at home and all of that, like that has not been erased from us. But in terms of disconnect, I feel it in the sense of uh, when I call my cousins over in Sudan and they're like, oh, you speak like a white person. And I'm like, <laughs> like, like, really? <laughs> like, oh. like, they're like, where'd your accent go? And I'm like, uh. so like things like that, I feel a disconnect in a way because um, I am not um with uh my Sudanese community and this Sudanese community here too has now uh very much been 
assimilated into Canadian culture. So like a lot of us don't even know our language or cultural customs and things like that. So um, finding a finding a connection in my culture came with a black culture already already prevalent in the Western world. And um, I guess my own too, like delving back. How did that process look like with you? So I think for me, something, this is a difference and you can like, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think because uh, a lot of like, at least Chinese people or like a lot of East Asians in general, like they come here as immigrants. And so they don't have as much of like a culture set up for them here. And so what they see as the dominant culture, which is like white culture, they kind of like admire it in a way of like, oh, I want to get, I want to be like that. And so um, I think like for a lot of like black people, when you had like ancestors here already and then you kind of like saw that stripped away because of like colonialism it's kind of like a diss for your cousins to be yeah. like, yeah. like a white person right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but in like a lot of east asian families it's like you can speak perfect english no accent you sound like a white person that's amazing like that's the standard is to want oh. to be white a lot of the times like you know my dad practices trying to get his accent out of his english he doesn't want right. to sound um like he still comes from china as an immigrant um and it's this really weird tension to exist in because like as someone with like immigrants and with no like ancestral heritage over here it's like oh you want to keep some of your culture from before but you also want to assimilate really badly and I just had a lot of hard time like dealing with that because then my parents would also send contradictory messages like you are going to go to Chinese school and you are going to have to remember how to speak Chinese, but also make sure that like you fit in with like white kids and make sure that like you have friends, you have friends who are white and uh, white people are like beautiful, you know, they look really pretty. Um, and so, you know, today my Chinese is very mediocre because I had a lot of, I gave a lot of pushback growing up learning it because I felt very embarrassed speaking Chinese. And now I really regret that. But even though I regret it, and even though I know I would love to be able to speak more Mandarin, I still feel so alien speaking it. It's like, this isn't even me even though I know it is my first language, technically. So thank you so much for this interview. Thank you so much for um, hopping on my channel. This is for my editor, Ali Sundry. Please throw it up there. Throw it up, throw it up. Am I, am I clapping? <laughs> what am I doing? I, Dude, I was just doing. like, I'll open up the channel here, maybe. Oh, <laughs> you know, that idea. Sorry, I just be doing things sometimes. I don't be telling people stuff. Let's turn it back one more time. I'm Erin Ock, the trans non-binary woman best known for making people cry with video essays and being undercredited by the audience for my work on other people's channels. Stuck in Alberta, but slightly less bad in Universe 666. I started by organizing charity streams and I've had a bunch of video essays and they said, you should also make video essays. So now I make video essays and I also animate, write, and edit for a bunch of different channels, including Terps. I know too much about The Matrix and I will read you 10,000 words of an unfinished script if you let me. Well, community is a building, not as a building as an edifice, but something that we build together for each other and because of each other. And it's not building something for harmony or unity. That would be great, but nothing is perfect. I think it's just a community of people who have faith in each other and see a human world designed to fill their group and individual needs. A community is a remaking, a building, and a constant remaking again to make something that is for I and thou and hopefully us. As long as you adhere to the system, you can be a Spider-Man. It's subjective and manufactured. The Spider-Verse system exists based on an arbitrary set of events that inherently need to be met in order for a Spider-Man to be a Spider-Man. At least in Miguel's eyes. His theory is ingrained in a sense of normalcy connected to instances of trauma which disclude which Spider-People can be Spider-Men. Instantly, this proposition of distorted reality sets a rigid structure of priority, but the severity of an anomaly is dictated hierarchically by Miguel O'Hara. Spot is way more of a universal threat than Miles. 
He has the power to warp realities on a mass scale, the ability to simultaneously exist in multiple dimensions, and the negligence of calling Chai Chai T. Who's gonna stop him? He's a menace, to say the least. Miguel O'Hara acts as a useful fool in service of structural obedience because of his stubborn need to uphold a hierarchy that is dismissive. The power of control is his. He's more comfortable manufacturing conformity within spider society rather than toppling the biggest threat these systems of priority create. This thought process of backwards liberation produces a carnivorous belief that these canon events are needed, and pushing against the status quo is cause for Spider-Man to be ostracized, punished, even killed if it comes down to it. Miles Morales is the most visible form of chaos against this governing power of adherence we see throughout the movie, but there are still countless inferences of law within Spider Society that just don't make sense. A popsicle can be a Spider-Man, Peter Parker can live happily ever after with Mary Jane and have a spider baby, Penny Parker can have psychic connection with her spider and utilize it in machines, rather than the traditional method of being bit, some spider bites are more powerful, some less, Gwen Stacy can join the spider team without experiencing all of her canon events. We know that if you conform, or at least pretend to, and adhere to Miguel's strict structural laws of adherence, then you can be a Spider-Man. An allegory for police, one might say. Mimicking our own backwards perceptions of legality. Granted, half of these anomalies were indirectly influenced by Miles, and Hobie still gets treated as lesser. Miguel's the OPP. He's an intergalactic police ranger carrying on the myth of structural adherence into the Spider-Verse. He's a wannabe Edward Cullen in Walmart brand knockoffs of 2000s Hot Topic fashion. He's a scene kid with daddy issues who thinks brooding is a substitute for having a personality. Miguel, I might as well tell you. The only Miguel I like is Miguel de Cervantes. You, my brother, could gather a gang of your friends in a circle, hold hands, like the ring around the rosy thing we used to do in great. I could be in the middle of the circle, so y'all could take turns kissing my ass till y'all jaw gets sore. Listen here. I ain't see a black versus Latino conflict this bad since Black Panther. And at the risk of starting a diasporic war, the scoreboard looking hideous for y'all right now. I ain't gonna lie to you. Y'all 2-0. Oh. You always talking about the fate of the multiverse. You need to talk about the fate of your follicles, primo. Spending all this time chasing black Spider-Man, you need to chase Rogaine. You see, you see Miles Morales have whole afro. You hear thinner and more flaccid than my cock. When you come on the screen! Despite the Spider-Man coming from all of the worlds, from all types of species, all races, all backgrounds, and spectrums of disability, and queer identities, it seems that most of the Spider-Man you see in the show are white, cis, able-bodied, allocisset men. Despite them being outnumbered by the vast amount of people of color in the world, despite roughly half the world being women, white men are still given the most representation in the system of the Spider-Verse. Thus we see that the Spider Society reflects the power structures that give disproportionate access and control to the privileged in our world. We can see historical oppression being highlighted through dialogue like Pivita's little quip of Always marginalized fight against the British company regime ruling his world, and Miles Morales fighting racialized odds of uncertainty in his everyday life, both within spider society and actual society. Anyway, because marginalization due to transphobia, homophobia, slavery, racism, cultural genocide, sanism, and ableist rhetoric of societal adherence repeats across the Spider-Verse continuum, and the vast majority of the Spider-Verse is privileged identities, we can deduce that the supposed bastions of power in a societal sense are the same as they are in our world. Even though the aspect of the spider bite is randomized, opportunity is not. Opportunity is disproportionately given to those with relations to power, presenting the ways white men are still centered in art. Hey, Aronoff, you, you gotta wrap it up. They're, they're calling you Woker Girl on the, on, on the Reddit threads. But I thought it was interesting. <laughs> But anomalies happen within human society, just like spider society. In both, people from diverse backgrounds, queer people, disabled people, racialized people, and various other groups, are actually granted some amount of place of stay, but only if they conform. And whether or not they are counted as conforming is incredibly conditional and revocable. The second Spider-Verse movie starts off with Gwen in Chelsea, New York, drumming chaotically offbeat to the band of her universe put together by her friends, while reminiscing about her old friends made in the past, specifically Miles. The scene is telling us metaphorically through her frenzied style of play, in contrast to a disjointed thoughts, 
that she doesn't feel like she belongs in her world. She can't open up to her friends. Her dad's a violent, power-drunken cop, hyped up on the idea of punitive justice. Like them all? Exactly. We can actually already see the contrast in Western canon between Miles and Gwen. Miles being a black mass from Brooklyn, New York, while Gwen being a white winter walker from Chelsea, Gwen has more of an opportunity to fit within the systemic landscape of disparity that disenfranchises people like Miles and uplifts more affluent people in more affluent areas like Gwen. In the first Spider-Verse movie, Gwen literally gets into a charter school without having to do a test. Terp's research and our shared headcanon is telling me that it's due to the predatory area code system that disproportionately affects marginalized people. But regardless, Gwen's story is a search for freedom countered with conditions. That thing that everyone was cheering Miles on for, for being an anomaly within the system, came to Gwen in less than a week. All Gwen wants is acceptance. But the same community she subscribes to limits her freedom under restraints. Framed for killing the beloved school student in her timeline, Peter Parker, her identity is now criminal. And her identity, be it literal or literal, needs to be kept secretive to keep herself safe from this outside world enacting a hate campaign against Spider-Gwen. Her cop dad loves his daughter but hates Spider-Woman, although one and the same. Spider-Woman, Gwen's true self, killed someone who was like a son to him, who once sat at the dinner table beside him. The message is in the details. It's important to note that Gwen is heavily transcoded. So I hope you can see why queer people, especially trans people, connect with this character. I mean, she has a trans flag on her wall, for fuck's sake. However, Gwen is unfortunately a conformist, which is human. It's understandable even as it's incorrect because all people are to some extent seeking to find their place in the tapestry of humanity. And when we're rejected by friends, by family, by jobs, by society, Let's say it's a jarring experience to not fit in. But the solution is not to capitulate to that system. It's to break it. And Gwen fails that. Oh, and yes, that does imply that all spider people are inherently queer in some way. Which, yeah, they all have secret identities that they hide from society, but slowly let in those who are closest to them. They fear being outed, and they struggle with not belonging and with trying to find a society of their own. We live in a society, we live in a society. Which is relatable, but when you're in a community of people that are cogs that don't fit in the mechanism of society, and you keep trying to ram yourself, and thus those around you, back into that mechanism, well, you're doing a violent injustice to the people around you. Something Gwen would soon find out with the help of her interactions with fellow anomaly creators. After a little bird fight in a Post Malone feature everyone seemed to laugh at the six times Turb saw this movie. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. You can't blame me. What is a, what is a Banksy? What, why are we laughing? I feel like I wasn't in on a joke. It's okay, Turb. You don't really need to know. It's just pretentious white people shit. While serving power, elegance, and cunt, she saves dozens of lives from a haywire airplane about to crash into a museum. Even though Gwen has saved so many lives, essentially doing the supposed job of the police much better than they ever could, her father is still hyper fixated on the identity of Spider Woman. On the identity that supposedly killed that boy all those years ago. It doesn't matter that Spider-Gwen is a hero. In his eyes, in a cop's eyes, her work is meaningless because of her identity. So much so that her father asks his fascist friends to look out for Spider-Woman's appearance, without even mentioning the raging renaissance bird destroying the building. The 16-year-old girl is now distraught without a place to go. And Miguel and Jess see her potential to do great good, so they take her in after her father pulled a gun on her and was ready to kill her for her identity. For killing his son, metaphorically speaking. Gwen, frozen by trauma and unsure of having any future at home, follows in the footsteps of her supposed adoptees, which is an unfair, unbalanced relationship, but a natural result of the disenfranchisement she's experienced because of her identity. The point being, Gwen is very obviously trans. It's blatant, but because you don't want her to be like us because you don't want anyone to be like us it doesn't matter how much support we provide for that reading it doesn't matter how much is there in the text it doesn't matter that she has a trans flag in her room it doesn't matter that she wears a trans flag colored outfit it doesn't matter that the world becomes a wash in the colors of the trans flag when she comes out to her dad it doesn't matter that her dad rejects her like transphobic family members reject trans people. It doesn't matter that she connects to our lived experience because our lived experience doesn't matter to you. Unless a character says in no uncertain terms that they are trans, y'all will refuse 
to read between the lines. One is still a white girl though. White girl make white mistakes. Yeah, but like being put in a system of priority has blinded her to the perils of her friends around her. I'm getting to that. Give me a moment. Uh, is, sorry. sorry. After Gwen joins the interdimensional spider police <laughs> by mean society, she conforms out of trauma and because of the manipulation and influence of the people who saved her. Because she is so desperate for acceptance, she conforms to the system that polices anomalies, despite having been the victim of a system that polices anomalies. Hobie is first introduced as a foil to Miles' relationship with Gwen, in the same way that a lot of Turb's masculine insecurities fester. Sorry, bud. That sentence was all you. Miles thought they were together, which is understandable because of age similarity and Pavidir saying, but the relationship is platonic, with Hobie and Gwen's found family dynamic furthering the queer reading. Daniel Kalua, who voices Hobie, said that, They're part of this band, and one of the reasons why Hobie was there was to have Gwen's back. He wouldn't be rolling around with the spider society otherwise, but he felt that Gwen was not well. So I don't think Gwen used Hobie for that. I think they have a genuine friendship. It was to have Gwen's back, and at the end of the film, he gives a gesture to Gwen again. He just has her back, you know what I mean? Someone's gonna watch somebody, and he wants to hide how much he cares. He watches over people that are coming from the same type of place that he feels he comes from. So him being in the spider society is a lot of that. Hobie's engaging in the long history of looking out for and helping other queer people. The metaphor of Gwen being a homeless trans kid crashing at her punk friend's place is not subtle. Gwen is being negligent, endorsing in a system that actively polices who can be a Spider-Man, and she knows this. It's implied that she'd rather help Miles fit in with Spider Society than continue dictating his own canon. For Spider-Verse to meaningfully comment on racism and failures of solidarity from white queer people, it needs Gwen to mess up, and it needs Gwen to learn and change from that messing up specifically in a way that does not use marginalized people as tokens for her growth. When Gwen functionally comes out to her dad as a woman, Spider-Woman, resulting in her dad leaving policing behind, she realizes that not only is she also an anomaly, but also exactly how she failed Miles, while the film is also revealing something important about Miles' own plot beats and stories. Miles can save his dad because Gwen was able to save hers specifically by having him not be a cop. I also feel that there's a significant double standard in how Gwen is treated compared to basically every other spider person that sided with Miguel. You do not see the same vitriol for Peter B. Parker or Jessica Drew or even Miguel as you do for her online. There's a lot of people heavily ignoring the type of influence that Miguel and Jessica had over Gwen. She was nearly killed by her own dad and saved by these two people. That creates an unhealthy loyalty she has to overcome. In the same way, a lot of white liberals, including marginalized white liberals, will try to sort of help marginalized people through diversity programs and tokenizable representation. Telling someone to change who they are just to fit in, to be a cog in the machine, is wrong. It's not inclusion, it's destruction. And her mindset of bending to spider society is wrong as well. In my opinion, a lot of people who hate her character, who hold a lot of vitriol for Gwen, are falling for one of the most common blunders in media comprehension. Being incapable of being normal about a teenage girl having a character arc where she makes mistakes. Seriously, this is a common issue. We also only have half a film, and while yes, the turning point of her arc being so late is short, that's because there's an entire film yet to come where we will see that change more meaningfully. And it's partly the climax of this film. And I don't know if you've ever been a teenager, but generally, it's a period of life where you often make mistakes, and then you have to, like, learn from it and grow. I think some people call it growing up. Maybe there's a theme around that in these works. I don't know. But it feels like a lot of people are refusing to ask why she's making the mistakes. What is the purpose of showing her make mistakes and grow from them? And what is the purpose of her character within the themes and narrative of the entire work? Her character growth and her failures are also in service to his story. It is, after all, his sense of betrayal that actualizes him into doing his heroic moment. It's almost like character flaws, failures, and overcoming them is good character writing. Maybe. Perhaps. Especially when it's a central theme. I just think there's value in showing someone who messes up badly and has to learn from it and has to grow from it and has to fix what they fucked up. And I think some of the vitriol for this character has nothing really to do with her character arc or the purpose of that character arc or what it does in the grander narrative. I just think it comes down to a lot of people can't handle a teenage girl making a mistake in a story, especially a trans-coded teenage girl. You are supposed to dislike her mistakes. You're right, Gwen messes up horrifically, but that doesn't make her irredeemable. That's kind of part of the point of the film. It instead makes her someone that needs to 
address her own issues, grow from it, and be a better person for others, which she does. That's kind of the point, because you're also supposed to self-reflect and examine how you might make those same mistakes or have made those same mistakes. And then you're supposed to root for her changing because you're supposed to self-reflect and want to change from your own mistakes. If they made Gwen simple, made her perfect and likable, it would make for a worse film, a worse character, because she is a character who exists to say something in this narrative. It just seems like a lot of people didn't want to listen. She also has to reconcile with the violent history of sexism in writing, how she's expected to fulfill the role of being fridged for a man's story. There are parallels between how black characters are often used to catalyze white characters' growth and how women are often used as objects to catalyze the growth of men. I think Spider-Verse manages to avoid these histories while commenting on them. However, while they both bolster each other, they also do not exist for each other, and they get to have their own growth on their own. None of that makes Gwen messing up okay, obviously. That's kind of the point. She has to learn and grow from it. But it does show how a lot of you are being weirdly punitive about this one select character in the entire franchise, while ignoring the purpose of her character, the purpose of her place in the story, the purpose of her character arc. Gwen isn't a great character in spite of making mistakes. Gwen is a great character specifically because she fucks up. Enter Hobby. Hobby juxtaposes everything we've seen in tandem with Gwen's conformity. After Spot invades Heavy Tour's world, he immediately comes in and breaks in Impenetrable's shield, stopping buildings from falling on civilians and inevitably supporting Miles against the cannon by not acting against him while he saved Heavy Tour's girlfriend's dad. Lastly, after realizing Gwen wasn't telling Miles how Spider Society perceived him, he doesn't leave her side, essentially protecting Miles, easing him into the interworkings of Spider Society. Then when Miguel explains the canon and policing the Spider-Verse and captures Miles, Hobby helps Miles break out by telling him yet again to use his palms with electricity, black flipping out, then chuckling, stating, my work here is done. The layering of allyship can be felt with a diversity of younger it's Spider-Man. just non, actually. N non bread is very redundant. Diversity, da 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 diversity, da 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 <laughs> color mine bitches what does positive integration mean for you i think positive integration means a, a lot of things kind of depends what you're integrating but if you're integrating like someone's culture i think it's very important that you're kind of taking taking parts of it that correlate from a point of truth but also from a point of respect um, I think there have been a lot of instances in Western media where um, there's been a lot of aspects of culture that have been taken sort of in a weird out of context way, but also in a way that's that's kind of trying to frame this culture in a not so positive light. Um, and obviously that has its own repercussions. Um, but I really think it's just about being tasteful and knowing you kind of you, you can't go about it if you don't know the culture, you don't know someone in that culture. Um, and I think most of the times when we've seen instances like that um, in today's media, it's because people just don't know what they're doing and don't want to know what they're doing. Um, so I think if you're going to integrate some form of culture, the person that's behind it has to be from that culture to some extent you know okay you, you caught me on a good hair day i'm low-key starting to get irritated with the word positive because you know the phrase like toxic positivity well in terms of integration and it being positive i say that it has a lot to do with showing diversity on screen but also having that behind the scenes just as well. And I am aware that the team behind this film was very diverse. I do wish that there were more women involved with like the production aspect of it all. But and when I say production aspect, I mean like writing wise, directing wise, producing wise. 
but i feel like they did like a good enough job there and one thing i want to elaborate a little bit more on that has to be with men in filmmaking i for one do think that men can tell great stories but because the film industry has such a long history of misogyny so much of that misogyny has just stemmed from the fact that women are just not in the directing chair they're not in the writer's room they're not there producing but i feel like this movie did a good job of showing like yeah we can be inclusive with these things and we actually know how to be respectful because a lot of people were talking about the pregnant lady jessica drew i was really happy to see that there was a pregnant black woman in a western animated film a mainstream western animated film specifically because usually when we see pregnant people in animation it's often like played for as jokes or whatnot like that's stuff that we would see like in adult western animation that is something that is still seen as taboo and that kind of blows me because the last time i remember there being like a pregnant person a pregnant person of color specifically would have to be like in 2001's the emperor's new groove really pretty lady by the way but for the most part in that film i always forget her name is her name chicha i really think her name is chicha. correct me if i'm wrong but chicha is the wife of the protagonist in the film and all she do is just be there she just sit there she look pretty and she just her belly's right there now it was nice to see that inclusion there but let's be completely honest she didn't necessarily contribute much to the story she didn't contribute to anything she was just kind of like there like yeah this is one of the first few times that we are seeing a pregnant woman in a western animated movie and it being a Disney movie on top of that. In The Emperor's New School, which was like the sequel to The Emperor's New Groove, she wasn't pregnant anymore. She had that baby, but we got to see her do a lot more. So it was nice to see her, you know, be more involved with the story and actually be more important. But it's just like that factor wasn't there no more because she like kind of had the child. And I feel like the way like we as a society view pregnant women, we kind of like view them as if they're like kind of helpless, I'd say. And I wouldn't just say pregnant women, I just say pregnant people in general. That's part of the reason why I really did like Spider Woman in this movie because while she was a pregnant woman, she basically just showed like, yeah, just because I'm pregnant doesn't mean that I can't do anything for myself. I can still whoop your ass. That's one thing I really, really liked about that. See, it's little things like that that I appreciate when it comes to the way Western animation is changing because some people are saying that Western animation is changing for the worse. I personally think that it's changing for the better because we are starting to see more people that are a, like a bigger reflection of the world because I don't want to sit here and spend too much time talking about spider woman being pregnant but I remember there was this video that went viral of this pregnant woman like very visibly pregnant and she was like working out and people were like you can work out where you're pregnant that's dangerous yada 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 and I was like I think because we as a society just view pregnant people as like helpless and that's why it's important to show things like that also she was dark skinned gorgeous we need more of that because western animation has a long history of being colorist and it's not even just western animation anime has a colorism problem just as well when it comes to spider woman she's not the only person that i really have like these strong feelings for when it comes to like how they're presented in this movie because you can tell that they actually put in the work to add this character because i said it's one thing for you to add characters of color or characters of different backgrounds and whatnot into your work but it's another to actually you know do good with them and that's part of the reason why I really did enjoy Hobie Brown's character because one punk black people exist alt black people exist I know this because I grew up listening to rock and roll and whatnot like I say like baby's introduction to rock and roll music would have to be Miley Cyrus but um love misery business I will fuck it up to misery business that's my Seeing that they showed that on screen, it made so many people that are alternative and black feel seen because we see that so many of the spider people come from different backgrounds and they're doing what they can do to protect their community or do whatever the fuck they gotta do. Miguel, listen, I have my opinions on that man. I'm gonna keep to myself because I don't need his stance coming for me. But thinking about how I'd say Into the Spider-Verse did a good job of writing its characters of different backgrounds, not 
not all but I said like a good amount of them I will say like giving like an example of where this was done poorly would have to be in my life as a teenage robot my life as a teenage robot is a show about a girl named Jenny who is a teenage robot and she lives in this community of all these like interesting people and my life as a teenage robot is a series while they did try to do something with diversity the way they did it was very distasteful and I didn't get distasteful from this film because I'm not saying that characters of color have to be portrayed in the most positive manner or whatnot but I'm saying that it's very telling when you have them in here allowed to be like the villains and the heroes and be the onlookers and all of that you have pretty good balance there and it's another for your characters of color especially the ones that are of darker skin where they're literally only sprinkled in in the background and then the darkest character in the show which is Brit Christ she is extremely villainized like I really don't like the way that that show wrote that girl because I always read um Brit crushed to be black. Brit was the dark skin one, Tiff was the light skin one and somebody was like but dark skin characters are allowed to be villains and I'm like yeah dark skin characters and just black characters in general are allowed to be villains in film especially animation but the problem is is that oftentimes when western animation wants to include a character of color into the mix especially one is a, that is of darker skin they are the villain. They are villainized. She literally is the main villain along with her cousin in the series because we had the stuff with the superheroes and the super villains that was that over there they were like the regular regular smegular villains and then when it came to the villains they look like mythical creatures yep animation does this thing where they add a character of color to the mix and they can be read to be like a different race and whatnot. Animation has a big problem with like you know the ambiguous brown the ambiguous person of color trope but with them two it's just like they were the only people of color we saw the most in the series girls of color specifically and they did that shit with them. That's why it's offensive and that's why I don't necessarily feel that way with Into the Spider-Verse because they had a good mix of people. How would you say Spider-Verse dealt with integration in the movie. Oh man, um, I think it handles integration really well. I haven't seen it in a while so I'm trying to think back. I do remember kind of seeing the trailer for the second one and just being kind of like starstruck in a way. Indian people don't have a lot of positive representation that makes them look cool and epic, you know, and kind of seeing a character in this film that is Indian and has an accent and lives in India, uh, but is also a really cool character and is very epic. Um, I was very surprised, very happily surprised. And I, th I think it means a lot to the kid in me because I know there are a, a lot of kids um, that see that or see things like that. Um, and their whole perspective has changed, you know, because if I had this when I was a kid, like who knows, you know, and I have two uh, younger brothers and one of them when he first saw it was 10. It changed, like I could tell it sort of changed his way of thinking about Indian people and who we are and what we can do. The art style, you know, the soundtrack, when they're in India, it's like, I don't know, just the way they were able to integrate culture into the film and have it have it be something of a positive impact is very, very important. Let me tell you something about white people. White people will always find a way to defend like other white people being like anti-black or POC. They be like, oh, they didn't mean it like that. Like I get it. Sometimes it do be an accident, but a lot of times it'd be like a recurring thing. But then they just like sit here and try to justify like, like the white people's racism when they have been called out about it numerous times before. Because a lot of people have this problem with Miraculous Ladybug and that's why I high key don't listen to no white opinions about that series no more because y'all always trying to justify this show being racist when we have called it out to the people in charge of it numerous times and they have seen it and they are aware of it but I said y'all need to learn how to talk to black people because that's not how you talk to one and I was like y'all really do need to learn how to talk to these people within your community it's one thing to appreciate blackness in film but also it is another where you need to be respecting blackness in real life like these are real people that you are in interacting with on the internet. These are real people that are seeing what you are saying. These are real people that are understanding it all and they're going to get irritated at a certain point. 
I remember back in the day where they would have like black performers perform for like white audiences and I cannot remember which artist it was but he performed for like this crowd of white people and I'm pretty sure he like slept in like his car because they didn't want to like book him like a hotel room. It's like they appreciate the things that black people put out and they appreciate them being in the media but they don't necessarily respect them. And I felt that the respect aspect of Hobie's character wasn't necessarily there for a lot of like the non-black fans of Spider-Man because if they did respect him they would not have done all of this shit to like change his appearance. So yeah that, that's just how I felt about that and honestly I understand it takes time to learn how to draw like more broad features and whatnot on um characters and whatever but y'all could have just drew the mask look y'all 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 could have drew the mask look like they were like oh I didn't know how to draw him looking like this so I did it like that I was like baby you you could have just drew the mask look then if you were struggling so hard why why you had to pull colorism and feature featureism and texture into this the community gonna have to catch up they gonna have to catch up Thank you guys so much for talking to me. I only have one more question. What is something you wanted to see more out of this movie? We have a lot of catching up to do in media when it comes to marginalized people, for sure. I'm very happy with what they're able to do with Indian culture, but of course, I want to see everyone's culture, you know? Um, just in, in in a way that, that counts. And I'm not just talking about in this film, but in in like all of media. Just because like, the world that we live in is is really diverse, you know? And this whole thing with like the Barbie film and how they didn't win the Oscar for best film. And then like, you know, how uh, that Martin Scorsese film did win and they won an award and people aren't appreciating that, even though, you know, the elite actress is a Native American w woman. It's, it's a huge deal, you know? And like people like don't seem to care. And it's really upsetting. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not necessarily the biggest when it comes to Spider-Man, I'm not. Um, I'm not somebody that is like a super duper big fan of Spider-Man. Like I appreciate it and part of the reason I appreciate it is because my friends really like it for the most part, but I just want them to keep doing what they do, but I do want them to make sure that they are talking to the community when it comes to them making this franchise. And when I say that, I mean like, I think it's important for creatives to actually get to know the community of people that they are writing for. So many of like people's problems with creating is that they don't actually go out and talk to these people about the stories they want to create about them. I think Spider-Verse has a very diverse team behind that, but if they do want to tell more stories involving women and girls of color, I do think that there should be more involvement of women of color and feminine presenting people of color just as well and involvement behind the scenes and i'm not just talking about like hey this is your job to draw this do this i'm talking about actually developing these characters actually be their producing be their directing but that's just me that's just how i feel but like i said it's very well done it's very well done but i'm very big on the subject of inclusion but because like the industry has like such a negative reputation of having such bad representation out here and that has to do with the fact that they are not in tune with the community that's why i often get scared when i see who is in charge of certain productions and the product that they put out kenya barris is one of them because i really have an issue with the way he writes not not just black women but mixed women just as well i have so many problems with that man's work and i don't get it because he has like black writers that are writing his stuff but at the end of the day it's a kenya barris production they're going to be like those ongoing annoying tropes that are going to be in that work so regardless of that it's always his works are always just going to be the same and no matter who was involved and whatnot because he has so much in charge of that it's not going to change much same with tyler perry man don't like to ask for help his best films are the ones where he had help okay like diary of a mad black woman is one of his magnuses i'm not even joking when i say that i adore that film that is my favorite feminine rage movie stop blowing them damn bubbles but i do have faith in this movie with how they went about it they just went 
into it with a lot of care. And that is one thing I always want people to think about when they want to tell a story about somebody that is different than them. You need to go into these stories with care. Down to the core, the supporting characters all represent strength and solidarity. Whereabouts? The older diverse Spider-Man represent comfortability in canon. The older Spider-Man have lived in the system for so long, the comfortability they feel in Miguel's fathomization of the Spider-Verse has rendered them susceptible to the same means of exploitation, which have harmed them their whole lives. Secondly, Gwen and Peter Parker's connections with Miles were the strongest, but conditional allyship limited their views on Miles' plight of anomalous nature. Remember when they told Miles all it takes is a leap of faith and celebrated him? Why have they now easily fell in line with with Miguel's anomaly theory after seeing Miles beat the cannon. Didn't his anomalous nature help Peter start a family? Why is it okay that the rules which they benefit from can be utilized against Miles? Sometimes arbitrary rules of favorability neglect black people. And in the same way, political actors, being most white people, feign ignorance to the system of priority and allow black people to be subjected to the canon events of evils just so they can be comfortable. I'm not saying I hate Peter Parker for being a caring father. No, but Peter has found comfort in his spider society. His family and child have blinded him to the perils of anomalous existence outside of his zone of existence. Seeing Gwen maneuvering through her experience is jarring, but this is a 16 year old traumatized child. Through canon events inside the Spider-Verse system, she learns she's destined to die. In every other universe, Gwen falls for Spider-Man, and in every other universe, it doesn't end well. She feels conflicted to conform because of the scrutiny from her dad, which awaits her and her old universe in tandem with what can happen if she helps Miles. Eventually, however, she goes back to her world with a little nudge from Hobby, meets her dad, comes out as Spider-Gwen. She becomes an anomaly in the canon, thus breaking her tie with the system which has deemed her complacent to the wrongdoings around her. A late realization, but a realization nonetheless. When it was a metaphor for the whole white liberal fathomization regarding structure, trying to find a cog in a machine that forces you to fit in a mold of what your identity being or role in society must be. It's a flawed idea that only leads to the deconstruction of cogs around. We have to create a machine that's inclusive to all cogs, no matter what that cog may be. How do you move through reality? Metaphorically, it's almost like putting on a mask, a mask of responsibility. I mean, personally, I have to write 30 pages of text every month or else I'm evicted. And I put on my mask like all other working people and try to fulfill my quota. Maybe for you, you could relate to a mask of social relation. Try to make people feel comfortable in your social spaces. So putting on a mask and trying your your best to get along with your counterparts. Or maybe it's a mask of survival. Maybe because your boss doesn't like a certain things you since hence you stopped wearing. You should really wear that strapless dress though. It looks good on you. And I'm not saying that because you're, you're thick. It's because you're These masks can impact us internally. Rewarding behavior is an excellent way to condition social adherence. Rewards socially have a different meaning when you take into factor what people can benefit from regarding their own subjective experiences. If I'm a five-star athlete that's a man, it's gonna be easier for me to get a paycheck for my talent than a woman of the same caliber. If if I'm white and wanting a matching position, my odds of getting higher are extremely higher than everyone else's. Than every other POC with the same criteria. And if I'm trans, well, the conversation to me even being in existence becomes a political talking point of degradation. Whereas if I was cisgendered, I could live my life freely. The Prowler brings up the question of subjective change. What if Miles Morales wasn't as lucky as he was? What if Miles' life circumstances drove him to less morally befitting means of survival? What's fascinating to me is the many ways experience can be mitigated or destroyed for the sake of social or economic prominence. I'm about to tell you a little story. There once lived a man named Booker T. Washington, a black thought leader and academic who vouched for America. He fought for his own idealized lived experience as an equal, making speeches to the president vying for black equality. Mr. President and gentlemen of the board of directors and citizens, one third of the population of the South is of the Negro race. No enterprise seeking the material, civil, or moral welfare of this section can disregard this element of our population and reach the highest success. I feel empathy for Booker T. Washington. He was a man who wanted the racialized structure to be refitted in the segregated South to benefit the lives of black people. But his approach is what fills my heart with woe anguish and disgust. Booker T. Washington had a nemesis, a rival, a Sasuke to his Naruto. Uh, sorry, this wasn't enemies to lovers. Sorry, fanfic, Ingles, Marks, view. 
viewers. Nah, but that theory actually makes sense though. Cause why was he paying all his bills? His rival was a man named W.E. Dubois. Although they were both two prominent political activists, one was loved and adored by the public, one was shot. Du Bois and Booker both fought against the notion of a Negro problem after the Civil War. The proposition of black people having rights being seen as a harm on society highlighted the moral fragility of the structure which they moved through. Now the black burden of reality at the time was being lynched, redlined, and denied entry from normative society on the basis of flawed existence. We needed a change. But this change was denied entry because the power was in the hands of political leaders who were white. In this cultural ethos of reality, how is peace morally viable under extreme structural disparity? W.E. Du Bois learned that veils of Western adherence blocked the male marauders from ever experiencing life outside of their own lived experience. I mean, they had separate schools, separate jobs, means of transportation, amenities, even water fountains. To break that comfortability, nothing except radical change could bring about true justice. While Booker decided he was going to shake hands and smile and peace his way in to white political circles. In a time where the KKK were literally raiding black neighborhoods, Booker became a useful tool of nonviolence against thought leaders like Du Bois in order to dispel more radical messages of violence against America's apartheid state. Du Bois became a political prisoner for his ideals, berated by the government, and eventually moved to Ghana in his later years. While his rival, Booker, lined his pockets with money parroting ideals of black capitalism, all the while contributing to no change, enjoying his structured emplacement inside this concocted crevice of white normativity, and died due to complications from hypertension. Washington's death was literally a mystery and then chalked up to racial characteristics by white doctors. Even while mitigating the perceived chaos of black existence by working his ass off to help white people subjugate marginalized groups. When shit hit the fan and Washington needed a doctor to society, he was simply treated as black. The same thing he neglected to destroy destroyed him. It's poetic, really. The same aliments of race relations being between black and white people, that hypertension. The one Booker Washington perceivably wanted to destroy, the one Dubois wanted to destroy. Instead, this membrane of white supremacy. All it did was become the barrier of entry to which either one of these speakers became validated. I lied a little bit for the sake of the majority. Booker T. Washington wasn't really black to me. Well, black is a noun in society. Having a lived experience under melanated skin, it's a verb to me. It's an action. It's, it's what you do with your message that gives you accessibility to community. In my books, because in the mortal words of Bell Hooks, there are black people I definitely do not want to unify with. In a society which denies racism's effects from a structural standpoint and instead mitigates experiences of disparity under colorblindness, their cries for freedom were terribly wrong for two different reasons. Dubois was too radical of a change, that being equality. While Booker was a comfortable secondary in the ethos of peace, white people created in the South. There's something inexplicably evil about using a culture birth from slavery, apartheid, generational suffering, and communal relevance as a tool to gain social capital in white spaces. This isn't even our land to begin with. They literally came here and emplaced that structure. There are ways black people can harm other black people through complacency with structural contingencies they refuse to reverberate. Remember that we call people like Booker coons over here for a reason. They've abandoned their communal realities of suffering in turn for their own benefit. There's a lot of coons out there. And think about that after you, a white person who benefits from the peace of society, berates a black person for calling out the peace as conditional, something we've so clearly seen for so many centuries. Again, there will be black people who only in death are reminded that they are black. It's fucked because I feel for them. The same lived experiences and internalizations of survival are probably closer to mine than any of my white friends. But liberation, community building, and safe spaces need to be kept away from from bad faith actors. on the accounts to the harm they do towards marginalized communities. The hardest part about this section is naming them directly, even though they've named me. They know of me and of my community know we're here, but instead seek to dismiss our struggle for equality as fruitless in the eyes of a greater struggle. Finding a crevice of peace inside white-centered politics. Me calling them out, especially on a platform revolving a majority white audience, would disturb the peace. So that's all I'll say. Enter Miles. The main character of the show I took 25 pages to get to, I'm sorry. Miles is leagues ahead of the uncertain kid we knew in the first movie. He's sure of himself, stronger and more confident in his abilities, detailed in his character model, being shown as taller and more chiseled in the face a year ago. And I love his new character model. Aunt May moves to Florida, 
weird. That's a no swing zone for some anomalies. And left alone Miles, who seemingly is thriving in his newfound position of responsibility. Well, aside from the three apology videos around endorsing a monopolistic company, frying a power grid, and growing a mustache. Me too. At this point in time, Miles just wants to meet his new frown friends from the first Spider-Verse movie. All those people that hop back in the other dimensions, Gwen and Peter, all the spider, spider people, spider pig. He's still an outsider at his school, presumably. I mean, when his father asks him if he's been running around with anyone, Miles literally replies with the names of the spider gang who's been gone for about a year at this point. His only friend, I don't know about friend. Yeah, friends don't crease each other's uh, other friends' Jordans like that. Miles makes tremendous strides with self-actualization too. In the first movie, he literally wanted to quit so badly, he filled out a test with all the wrong answers just to try to flunk. And now he's more exuberant about his opportunity in academia because he has the chance to become a real scientist, help with the particle accelerator, and hopefully reconnect with his friends through the Spider-Verse. Even though the same patronizing experiences of systemic oppression still consume his daily life, he's trying. He's trying to reconnect with his parents and be the best Spider-Man he can be defying the canon. The canon being subjected to conformity under his racialized experience. Through the first Spider-Verse movie, he learned that he could change the canon with his own hands. So why wouldn't he try under unnerving odds to change the same fate that he was subjected to? This clash of fate becomes a point of conflict with his parents. They still want him to maneuver through society in a way which they've been indoctrinated into. The parental subjective romanticization of success, which is academia. You go to school, you get the A paperback you show me. And that. yes, Miles still very much wants to go to school before his newfound friends, remember, not for personal or economic merit. His parents are pushing for this commitment through systemic opportunity, while Miles deems the systemic opportunity as more of a launching point towards community. Also, this experience is realistic, relatable even. How hard is it to really raise young black children in a system that deprives them of choice? As much as he wants to follow his dreams, he's also trying to appeal his parents' wishes in the process, messing up his own pursuit of happiness. We find out that Jefferson and his now deceased uncle, the Prowler, were businessmen. Comically accurate, being mischievous little guys. But we don't know if that's canon yet, so let's not do that. Let's not assume. They were businessmen in the past, meaning Miles' dad knows the severity of failing inside of a system not meant for you. Which is why it's so hard for him to fathom another way of success for Miles. There's some truth in the saying, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Literally intertwined with his failure to deliver the cake to his father's ceremony on time. He couldn't get his father his cake on time while he was trying to eat his. It's almost like there are actually writers with, with minds that actually think about things like this. And you should think about this when you watch movies like that, because you should think. A message to the white people I watched this movie. With. Although he tries again and again, it's apparent that their version of success hinders his internalized responsibility and dreams of being Spider-Man. Finally, Gwen appears, and after swinging around a little bit, her doing some op shit, um, Gwen and Miles circle back to their father's promo celebration. Again, their parents Parents are seen for a somewhat good reason, don't clip me Twitter, weaponizing their ingrained experience with racism to stop Miles from catching a snow bunny allegation. Y'all can't call me Dr. Umar, I use too much academia. Y'all will never get me. Gwen is terminally white, guys. The movie makes a display of this. She's white to a fatal degree. What is this? I gotta get my steps in. I love her though. Black parents know how much straight up degradation of character goes on in interracial relationships. So we not mad about that. We not mad about Miles his parents policing that whatever however miles heartbroken and distraught over the sudden disappearance of his love interest is comforted by his mom and here we learn through a sincere interaction of mother and child she knows miles is trying to do great things she's just trying to protect him from the world and finally she lets him go takes off the metaphorical leash of parental structure around him or not do what he wants to do. He takes this personally. Oh yeah, he does. Landing in Pavita Parker's world, fighting Spot, and then seeing a vision of his father dying after Spot reaches the super collider. Here, Ma learns of the terrors that defying the system can bring him. Death. Defying the system can cause death. But we also see Inspector Singh die. Miles goes on to save the Inspector 
effectively averting a canon event, something Miguel never thought could have been done, proving he can bend fate with his own hands. Granted, a dimensional rift opens in Pavita's world, but Spot was the anomaly that caused this mess, not Miles. But Miles gets blamed for it. Miguel wants to call this man the N-word so bad. Miguel is policing the structure Spider Society policing the ethos of power within his Spider-Verse. He decides what anomalies are in the ethos of structure that he's theorized, much like society. Joker moment. This is much like how society deems what justifiable success is in its exploitative nature. Miles defies the idea of canon yet again, blasts out of his cage, beats everyone ass and ends up going home. Back to his mom, explaining how he won. The attention to detail is wild. I remember multiple times coming home after an award, a championship or a stellar report card, yelling to my mom that I did it. I had, I got the trophy, I got the report card, I got, I, I, I did it. While she stood there proud with this exact body language, Miles proclaims he's won against all odds, the way so many black boys do. Now, what does Miles teach us about living in a system where choices are structured? I mean, we've seen what harm systems can do to the people we love in our everyday life. We know the terrorists of plight within community, yet we still uphold it as the status quo, from the homophobic to transphobic mindsets of bigots we refuse to act out against because they're transitioning kids, right? The allowance of black oppression because they're shooting each other in the streets, right? All the way down to the allowance of militaristic violence our country enforces on others because without it, we can't protect our freedom, right? These backward thoughts of conditional freedom actually stall us from realizing that structure is limited. It limits what we can or can't do, what we can or can't say, how we can or can't act, and what can or can't be. We should be fighting against the canon. We should dissect why untruths are spread, and we should strive to achieve an atmosphere of equality for us all. Miles is the embodiment of self-preservation inside of a structured existence. Yes, the spider people inside of the Spider-Verse are complacent, but by the end of the movie, even they are shocked at the lengths Miguel will go to keep pseudo-law and order in the Spider-Verse. However, they're too comfortable in the system to care about upheaval or justifications of discrimination. Enter the Prowler, Miles' supposed fate if he was never bit or draw the number 42. The question, however, shouldn't be, this fixed his destiny. We should feel compassion towards the twisted fate of the Prowler. Even as cool as he is, it's pretty fucked that his circumstances have subjected him to this fate. A system that subjects people to terrible fates or heightened opportunities shouldn't exist. Miles and the Prowler saw two sides of the same coin under the formation of structure. One was opportunity, the other was a lack of. Let me be clear, I'm not profiling the Prowler like I've seen a majority of these takes teeter to. The Prowler, in my prediction, in my subjective take, might come to some kind of middle ground with Miles and help him honestly. If he wanted to kill him, he would've. Bro punched the bag behind him just to press him. <laughs> but remember, the Prowler was supposedly the one meant to be bit by the spider that gave Miles superpowers before Spot intervened. Our existence in this time is experienced along with the pleasure and tragedy of our landscape. But our landscape, mi but our landscape mirrors duality. For as much millionaires and success stories you'll find, you'll realize there's thousands millions billions more tales of failure movies have a way of metaphoring reality although the spider-verse one was one of two its core meaning doesn't change when we have an opportunity do we deserve it why are we in the positions we are when we're seeing people suffering do we deserve the opportunities we have our society pits certain people above others, absolves them from criticism, while we cheer for their accomplishments. And although accomplishments in good faith should be cherished, when is enough? When will we talk about the pitfalls of despair 10 people go through in order for one to prevail? The Prowler is the story of a majority of marginalized youth who become a product of their discriminatory environment. Into the Spider-Verse, yes, teaches us that our canon is in our own hands. Our opportunity, no matter how little or plentiful they come, should be used in the favor of common good, however. We all have free will, and with it comes the ability to change the world around us. We should push for equality wherever we go, create spaces and friendships, workplaces, and communities of inclusion through your own power. However, some people don't have the same opportunities we do. There's percentages of the population that can't vocalize the systemic harm 
done to them because we treat it as shameful. Something we should forget. We can comfortably forget how putrid experiences of poverty and oppression are from the comfort of our circumstances. But people like the Prowler can't. They live it on a day to day basis. The structure of the Western world subjects us to internalizations of self-degradation in our work, while telling us depression in our circumstances are methods of systemic experiences needed for the greater good. But what about those that can't escape fate? What about those, the majority of people, who are embroiled by societal means of degradation to the point of failure? Miles and the Prowler really are two sides of the same coin. Now, what's your way in this mosaic of hell we call North America? How do you try to subvert means? Uh, I can't speak for everyone out there, but it's very apparent that something needs to change. If you can do it another way, if you can make it just a percentage better for the people around you, try. Like, really, why shouldn't you try? Masks are a really good tool to protect others from COVID, write to your senator about world events. Even though I doubt they'd listen. Try in your inner circles to experience intersectionality. Open up. Learn more about each other. We don't all have to be quiet statistics. In order for change to be brought upon our environment on a wider scale, we have to do it our own way. We can't be subjected to a thought process which discludes and creates anomalies. Along with opportunities we have in our lifetime of success in, in, of success in academia, workspaces, relationships, and comfortability, inside our lives there are still holes of anomalies. Anomalies that seem unavoidable. But with your power, I want you to try. Please. Thank you so much to my Patreons. This was the first major link project I did in a while. Through writing this, I went through extreme highs of happiness, collaborating and writing with my friends, but there were also lows, low, 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 lows. I want to say to the people out there, or other person out there, yeah, yeah, you, the person I'm referring to, I hope you're doing well. I hope you stop and smell the flowers when you walk outside. I hope your exuberant passion about the potential of life hasn't faded, and I hope you found peace. I love you so much that my heart can't express it in length. The love comes unconditionally, but I gotta do things my way, the same way you have to do things yours. Thank you for existing for a brief period in my life, which transcended time in a way I'll remember forever. It was a fun dance of sincerity, passion, and empathy. I'll treasure your memory the same way I hope you treasure mine and bid you the best. Bye for the last time. Bye. Till next time. For real this time. And may the anomaly that is you prevail. Bloom magnificently through the light of your own radiance this time. You know, it's kind of funny how flowers die more beautifully in the midst of light.